Like, well, I didn't know I didn't that know a that song, that song called, about you know, slaughter. Pineapple Highway was about puppy slaughter. <laughs> like, I don't, I didn't know. They we're, talked we're about. Not, we're not hip enough to understand what things are actually no, meaning No, I'm these not days. hip enough. Uh, yeah. All right. Speaking of <laughs> Speaking not of hip being enough, unprepared and not are hip. You ready? <laughs> are you ready for number nine? Yes. This is number 91, right? 91. We're, right, right about that. Okay. We're in the 90s. <sighs> yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's. You, you, you start. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 91 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver to this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about piston fillers versus cartridge converters, Goulet ink art and moving more digital. We're gonna be talking about what Lamy 2000 limited edition colors that we would choose if we could. We got some pens that uh, we think may have average bodies, but great nibs, as well as ones that have great bodies, but average nibs, I think I said that right. We're gonna talk about our perspective as a retailer on minimalism and ethical consumption. And we're gonna update on our long weekends that we had because we both did some stuff. Memorial Day happened. Yeah, it did. And long weekends come along with that. Indeed they do. Uh, but we're gonna start it off with some feedback as we always do. All right. We got fed back this week from Laura. Mm. And right. Laura starts off with, agree with Drew, which just draws my eye. Mm. So yeah. generally I'm like, oh, well, well you do, do you? Do mm. tell. Mm. Just like seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, agree with Drew. My Visconti Mythos Aphrodite is my favorite pen now. Love mm. the writing and the feel of the pen in my hand. All right. I love I love the Mythos. And it, it's, uh, I think, one of the reasons it, I, it really was memorable to me because I mm. wasn't expecting it to be yeah. as good as it was. Absolutely. It really kind of caught me off guard. I feel like most things come down to expectations. Yeah. Like if you're pleasantly surprised by something, then that's always yeah. better. Yeah, I was like, oh, Steel Nib Visconti, okay. And then I was like, what? Steel Nib Visconti? I mean, that's a good case to be made for like why a lot of inexpensive pens are more popular is because people may not expect as much out of them. Whereas yeah. when you get to the really high-end stuff, everybody expects them to be great. Yeah. So they have to be great. Mm -hmm. And if they aren't, matching up to that greatness in any way, then it's disappointing. That's a good point. So, yeah. That's a good point. Um, JT says, I was re-watching some old pencasts and write-on episodes during a recent Ooh. pencast hiatus and was going to suggest some more blindfold tests, so I was really pleased to see it come back. Yeah. The other bit I love from old stuff is meeting members of your team and talking to them about their role and their current pen. Any chance of some of that in the future? Pretty please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it'd probably be easier to just like do like a, a segment where I walk around and talk to people and then just kind of like pop that video into the pen cast rather than trying to get people in here to talk. Oh, but yeah, yeah, we can totally make that happen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we have company meetings every week. I can go bother some people. Mm -hmm. I'm good at that. And then fine, uh, finally, WKS Simmer says, in response to our, what are the weirdest pen bodies we've seen? Brian's looking it up now as you should mm. be. Uh, this was not the only person who recommended we take a look at the Rotring Core as a really odd looking fountain pen. So this came up a couple times in the comments and it is a fountain pen, but it was a, uh, so Rotring is a uh, German company uh, as far as I know. And um, mm. um, they made a funky pen. Keep on scrolling down because it gets weirder. Yeah, just just Google the Rotring Core. Oh yeah. It's, um, like, it's just a funky looking pen for it sure. It's pretty funky looking. And then keep on going down. They're like the, the uh, where the cartridge plugs into the, pen is weird too because there's like a latch that kind of huh. hold like clamps on like clamps to the, onto the cartridge yeah it's, it's kind of smart very strange and the, the, the nib's a very bulbous looking mm. funky okay. funky thing too so yeah definitely definitely an odd bird there yeah the grip is like offset yeah it's like not in <laughs> line with the nib which yeah. is interesting but Rotring's a, yeah they're an interesting company because they do they're like more of a technical writing a lot of like company. very fine liners and things yeah, like, like that. Yeah, like the rapidograph yeah. that was like used it used like India ink. Yeah. That was like an ar architect's pen and stuff like that. Yeah, we've always yeah. been tangentially aware of that brand, but never Well they've never, never made like at least since we've been around, they've never made products that have been like bullseye fountain pen enthusiast yeah. type products. I know about them from people that are like, oh yeah, I used to use them back in the day mm -hmm. for XYZ. Rotring core, interesting. I'm not really familiar with this thing. I had never, uh, never seen it. It's weird, and I, and I want to have it in my hands because it's weird. 
because I like weird bands. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. All right. You can take it from here. It debuted in 2000. Okay. So I don't know if it's, is it still made? Maybe not. Maybe it's not made anymore. I don't know. That's what eBay is for. It looks like a pen you'd find under the seat of a Dodge Neon. I like oh, that line. Oh, nice. Tim Hoffman, your review of this pen from 19... 19- or 20, 2019. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm digressing yeah, here. Yeah, you're up for the feedback here. Oh, yeah, my turn. Okay, Um, this is from The Talking Haggis. Have you ever had haggis? I've never had haggis, but I know what it is, and it sounds really nasty. It wasn't but it, nasty, but it was very, like, it really coated my mouth, oh. and, like, it was kind of hard to just get down. Oh. Because I, it was weird, because it was, it felt dry, but I knew it wasn't dry. It was like mm. mushy in my mouth. I'm like, why is this not going down? When did you have haggis? It was at, uh, my aunt took me, who's, she's she's very plugged into our Scottish roots. Um, okay. So she knows all the history. So she took okay. um, Shannon and I to a Robert Burns dinner one year. Oh. And they did like the whole ceremonial cutting oh. of the haggis. Um, oh. It was a big to-do. It was a very, really entertaining night. Okay. Um, and, uh but no, it wasn't flavor wise. It was fine. It was just okay. I just remember being kind of like sticky, and, and the consistency was didn't want to didn't want to didn't want to go down go down the gullet. No, made no. you work for it. Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Wow, it really sounds appetizing. <laughs> you want to get right on that. Well, anyway, the talking hag. The talking hag. Is, is yes. what we're talking about. Um, I spend all my commuting time, about an hour total each day, listening to Brian and Drew and the Pencast. Loads of fun. It's lighthearted, informative, and not even the slightest hint of elitism or snobbery. Cheers, lads. Great stuff. Well, I don't know how we could be snobs. I'm literally talking about eating haggis and <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. So, I don't know. Uh, okay. Kang Young says, I was an aggressive sneezer too. There we go. It's a, a kindred spirit over there. Uh, we can learn to sneeze a bit quieter, actually. Try not to inhale when you're about to sneeze. Guaranteed. Try not to inhale. See, my sneezes attack me violently. <laughs> so you I don't, don't know you don't, that I really get you don't much have a, you don't have like a <gasps> and then a, yeah, I guess I do now. That I think about it. Yeah. So that's 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 like fueling up. Me. You're charging up. You say you can't charge. Hmm. But then also there was another comment that said, you know, very kindly that you and I are both getting to the age where we just need to let it let it sneezes just happen because we're happen. getting so old that it could injure us. I know. If you try and hold it in, yeah. like when I see people that like literally like hold their nose and like hold it in, I'm like, that can't be good for your body. You're gonna like break a vertebrae or something i do that from time to time i never do that there's no situation where i'm like i can't sneeze i don't want to like startle some also my dogs bark a lot and i don't want to sometimes things are peaceful and so i'm just kind of like you know (laughs) (laughs) you don't want to disturb the peace no oh my gosh okay um chris gb says i'm nearly disappointed brian you did not complete the deep dive i understand I didn't do a deep enough dive, apparently. What? But for Chris, uh, I understand that Ebonite used to be a brand for hard rubber, which you mentioned as vulcanized rubber. But what is vulcanized rubber? <gasps> I thought I covered this. It's the same thing. Hard rubber is vulcanized. Like vulcanization is hard rubber. But what does vulcanization mean? Oh, I didn't get into no. like the, <laughs> the actual vulcanization process. No, please don't. But oh, I'm just saying, I see. Like, I feel like Chris is just egging me on a little bit here. Maybe a little bit of both, but I, I did uh, not explain the actual like process for vulcanizing. Like, how does rubber, rubber get vulcanized, and why would someone vulcanize rubber? <sighs> it's a good question. For another I'm not, day, I'm, we'll save that. We'll for save another that. day, we're going to make somebody else ask that, and then that can be another <laughs> deep dive. There right? we go. Uh, okay. You know what, um, uh, Craig, who. Um, had a segment on last episode's pencast uh just in my continued conversations with him after being featured on the pencast he uh blamed me for deciding to put up a new video saying that he's now going to begin focusing on modern pens um a little bit more (laughs) because he's just been a little bit more drawn into the loop so uh (laughs) yeah he's like this is your fault i was like sorry craig (laughs) but yes drew likes to egg people on modern pens Mm. there we go Cool. This is the way. All right. That's what we got for feedback this week. Uh, let's talk about some new stuff. All right. We've got a couple new things to mention here. A little I light, but 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 little quality over quantity. Quality. Well, not uh, quality, but not quantity on this particular one that and I have to fine, mention. That's fine. That's um, fine. So there is a new Edison Collier made of material called Gerolite, which what? is very interesting. However, we thought it was going to be made regularly available, but we just found out like within the last week 
that they're actually not gonna be able to get, I think it's a material for the grip especially, they're not gonna be able to get that. Like the supplier they had for that, can't can't really get it anymore uh, reliably. So they the were just they're making resin? kind of it. I don't know exactly what oh. the issue was, but there was some supply issue that they had. So it's it, it's going to end up being kind of a one and done. So mm. you know they probably would have maybe approached it differently if they knew from the beginning that it was going to be a one and done. They might have like made it a more of a special edition, limited edition type thing. But instead, they like kind of launched it as this is going to this is a new offering, a new color of collier, and it turns out it's going to be very limited. So. I think it's limited to 150 pieces. What is Garolite? So Garolite, I had to look it up because I'd never heard of it before this pen came out because apparently I need to deep dive on more materials in my life. Um, so it's a butterscotch brown uh, woven fiberglass, uh, I believe is the process. Woven fiberglass laminate that's bonded with epoxy. So it makes it very stable, durable, and wear resistant. So a, gla well, a glass reinforced thermoset composite, oh, yeah. I believe is a technical term. So thermoset composite, yeah. Yeah, whatever, uh, whatever that means. Yeah, glass well, you know, uh, TSC. That's what the that's what we call it. Is that actually the term? Nope. Thermoset composite. Yep. Nope. It I could don't. be. I don't know. I never really know if Drew's like BSing me or if he's just. Uh... You know, the other day, <laughs> the other day, um, Brian K came up to me and was like, "Drew, tell me a fact that's not true," and I was like. Um, well, a squirrel's paws are all actually symmetrical. They don't have like, you know, um, they're not inverted, you know, left to right. It's one of the only mammals like that. And he's like, yep, and walks away. I was like, why did, why did you want me to tell you that? He's like, because I knew you could BS me in something really convincingly and random. And that was all. So like, oh, pretty good. well, okay. So it's he just, like just obscure enough to where it's like, yeah, I'll believe that, but I don't care enough to go look it up yeah, so myself. He was, just, he was just testing me, yeah. I guess. I'm like, wow. that's, that's fine. Oh. It's like a gift. It's a I, gift you have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is that a backhanded compliment? I don't even no, know. I'll take it. I'll take I guess it. This is a gift. I mean, yeah. Anyway. No press is bad press. So uh, the Garolite Collier, we're not going to have very many of them. We were excited about it and we were going to plan to have a bunch. It, I don't even know if we're going to have them by the time this video launches. We might not. It depends on when we launch the pen. But anyway, if you happen to be into it and you happen to see this and we happen to have any or you see it available anywhere else, get it because it won't be around for long. And then I'm going to stop talking about it because I don't want to make more people want it. Drew? There we go. What do you got? Um, I got something I'm really excited about, Brian. <laughs> so we have had, in the past, a Banu collection within <clears throat> the Euphoria model <clears throat> called the Refreshment Collection. And yeah. within that collection, we've had some real bangers like the uh, Iced Caramel Latte, yeah. like the Rainbow Slushy, like the uh, Sangria, cookies and like cream. the Cookies and Cream, oh, yeah. the Watermelon Mojito, and the newest addition <clears throat> to that line is going to be the confetti milkshake. And we can't call it Funfetti because that's licensed by Pillsbury. So it's not Funfetti. It is no. Confetti milkshake. So mm -hmm. it has sprinkles in uh, suspended in a white creamy barrel. And it looks like a confetti milkshake. It looks absolutely fun and joyous and, and, and whimsical and happy. So if you need a little bit of that in your hand during your writing adventures, this is the pen for you. And those are my ideas. That makes it awesome. So it's pretty solid. Yeah, one forty nine. Same price as all of the other Euphorias, and um, it will. Uh, well, it's launching. If you're hearing this right now, on Friday, hmm. it will have launched on Tuesday. So it's available. Maybe you already bought one. If that's the case, you did the right thing. Yeah. Smarty pants. It's a cool looking pen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we I wanted more sprinkles, but we didn't want you know. Benu was like, "Hey, we don't need to affect the structural like, integrity of this the pen thing." Might now. not hold together if you put more sprinkles. Yeah, in this so, in so, there. so so it's so it's you know a little conservative on the sprinkles, but it, it, there's enough. There's enough. You can't. I mean, happy, happy, joy, joy in there. Yeah. You don't want like the whole thing just sprinkles. I mean, I wouldn't say no to it, but yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Well, fun fact here: Rachel loves sprinkles. It is like one of the joys of her life. I was. She will be all. Any donut she ever gets, she wants sprinkles on it. Yep. You know, it's one of the things. I was overjoyed recently because we were tasked at a party to bring dessert items, and usually we just mm. go and get a Ucrops chocolate cake. If anybody lives, you know, in the Middle East coast over in the U.S., um, Ucrops was a supermarket chain that makes a banging chocolate cake. So we usually just do that, and people know that we're not great at cooking, so they're just like, "Yeah, hey, just bring a Ucrops chocolate cake." But yeah. I said, "No, I want to do something cool." So I wanted to bring <laughs> a, you know, ice cream sundae situation and oh. i got all the fixings i got all the 
you know, drizzles wow. and stuff. I got chocolate sprinkles and regular sprinkles. But now, since it was extra, we mm -hmm. have regular sprinkles in the house. And that is what I prefer because Shannon buys the little tiny balls, little crunchy little things. Little nonpareil Yes, deals. yes, those. And I hate those. I like the waxy sprinkles. She's like, no, they're not even, they're weird consistency. It's not even sugar. I'm like, I don't care. That's what sure. I want. It's like, it's like. I don't know. I don't care what it is, but they, they melt better in, in mm. cakes, in pancakes. Oh yeah. So I made some, you know, confetti I pancakes I like that they this, aren't this as weekend. crunchy. I like yeah, that they're a little softer. Right? I yeah. agree. But yeah. we're a divided household on that. How about that? Yeah. But not anymore because we get both. The non though, I feel like they don't, they don't stay on whatever it is. No, they just like, roll off. You gotta like mash them on. No, whatever they go is. cattywampus. Little little tip here. This has nothing to do with pens, but I guess we're talking about sprinkles. Yep. I, I think I learned this trick like maybe two years ago. Eh, maybe it was a couple of years more than that. You got a sprinkle trick, but Brian? To put sprinkles on cupcakes, you don't sprinkle them on the cupcake with like the frosting up because they won't stick that well. What you do is you put them in like a bowl or a plate mm -hmm. or something like that, the sprinkles, and you take and the you... cupcake and you just, oh. you just mash it right onto there and then you get like Full mm. sprinkle coverage on the cupcake and they get kind of pressed into it and it's much less of a mess. Can't say I've actually done that before. Like I needed to do that, but, that, want, but I do have if like If you a, want a lot of sprinkle coverage, yeah, that's the way to do it. If you don't have a lot of sprinkles on the plate, then like the frosting will stick to the plate and then it'll be kind of a mess. That's how you do but, it. Yeah. That's wise. I, I've, I've done that before with like a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cinnamon muffin, you know, you kind of roll it in, roll yeah. the top with some like a cinnamon yeah, butter, kind of deal. cinnamon yeah. sugar butter thing. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Sure. Yeah. Anyway. Great. So those are some fun new pens. There you go. Let us know in the comments what kind of sprinkles you prefer, I guess. Are you like the non pareil little crunchy ball type? Or do you like the waxy, you know, big chunky ones that yeah. look like, you know, what do they look like? They're long. They're like oblong. Yeah. You know, those things. Those things. Cool. All right. That's it for new products for right now. Uh, let's get on to some Q&A. All right. This was simple, Brian. I just said, hey, Instagram, what should we talk about? Curiosities, debates, questions, what you got? Mm -hmm. And Voidec or Void EC says piston versus cartridge converter. Pretty simple, pretty open ended, but open -ended, uh, also, yeah. also, you know, elegantly simple. Not, not, not mincing words about uh, the 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 combat implied yeah. here. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, these are two filling mechanisms that are similar mm -hmm. in principle. Um, but they do kind of perform two different functions in a way. Uh, I like both, you know, basically you don't really get a choice on a given pen model between these two. It's pretty much a pen is designed with a piston or a pen is designed as a cartridge converter. And you kind of, I mean, I guess you can choose the model based on that if you want, but you're, I, I'm trying to think of a single pen model that I can think of that has both. I've been thinking the same thing. And I, I don't. Can't I don't. Really I can't. Think of one. I can't either. I think that um, there are some. Um, there are some. Well, I will say no. There were uh, a few Mayora pens that <coughs> had the option for one or the other. Um, okay. You can't okay. buy one that can do both, but they were available in available, two different versions. Okay. Yeah, like that's the, true. Like the Mitho. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Mitho, Mitho K, K was the one with the okay. with the um, internal piston, and then okay. the Mitho yeah. was cartridge. Or maybe I guess like the the Pilot Custom seventy four versus the Custom Heritage ninety two. Yeah, it's a different body style. It's not. Though. It's it's close. It's, it's not the close, same pen. It's not even called not the same the, pen. It's not the exact same pen. So, but so it's it's pretty close with Mayora, and I think that Delta might have it, or might be thinking about it. I know that I think that, you know, some of Nino's brands, Delta Mayor yeah. and Natuno, I think that that they've done some. I think that yeah. he might have done a few. Yeah. Yeah. But usually I think very uncommon. I think it's it's much more common to like pick one mode and kind of go with that for a given pen model. So, you know, it it it, it does kind of make it tough to say like if one is more popular than the other, or better than the other, because like the piston's more complicated for sure, so they're often more expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, because there's not like the same mode in the exact same models, you know, there's other factors that could make some models more popular than others that aren't exclusive to that style. So, and even if know. they are available, like the Mayora, they're going to be a completely different price point. So you yeah, can't compare that either. To say, yeah, like is it worth yeah. that much of a price difference? So, I don't know. Um, but I mean, the the majority, I would say, the most popular format like uh i say format like ink ink 
yeah, filling, filling, filling format filling style. Um, is the cartridge converter because it's going to be more economical for most brands. And it's more versatile, you know, especially a lot of European Probably more accessible. Brands. Yeah, like in the US, cartridges are not nearly as popular. It's much more popular in Europe. And then I'm not really sure how they are in, in Japan and other parts of Asia. If, if I mean, I think cartridges are still pretty widely used. It's yeah. probably the least popular in the US. Yeah, because I think um, the US is probably the country, you know, of, of the ones we've talked about, the ones that use them like there are very the few places that use them just as a regular tool. I think there are still yeah. places in Europe and Japan that use them just practically. Yeah. Which is funny because in the US you think we're like more of a consumable, disposable society. Yeah, not with you that. You think cartridges might be more yeah. popular, but it's probably just like the availability of them is not as easy. Like if you found them in every drugstore kind of a thing. So it may have been like they were, cartridges were more popular at one time. I don't know. I don't really know what I'm talking about there, but I know ever since we've been in business, cartridges have always been kind of an afterthought for most yeah. pens. So, um, but anyway, you're not asking about cartridges necessarily. You're asking about <laughs> converters, Voidek. Um, so I think in terms of a piston versus converter, like I like both. They're very similar functionality. Um, there are some pros and cons, and so I thought of some pros and cons to name for each of them. So um, rather than going just like pros and cons, I just basically, I thought of a few bullet points for like pros for each version. And you can assume that the con is that the other doesn't do that. The other one doesn't have that or isn't as, as known for it or whatever. So some piston pros, okay. Um, with pistons, you usually, not always, but usually get a higher ink capacity. You know, often two, maybe three times as much of ink capacity. Now there are certain piston filling pens that have a pretty small ink capacity. There's certain converters like the Pilot ones and like the Twisby ones where those converters have an unusually high ink capacity. Uh, but for the majority of pens, you're usually somewhere in the half a milliliter capacity for most converters. And you're usually in the one to one and a half milliliter capacity for most piston filling pens. So you can pretty well assume on most pens, you're gonna get more ink capacity. Now, is that necessarily a benefit? If you like to change your ink all the time, more ink capacity may not make any difference to you whatsoever. That's kind of Drew's camp, right? So whether that's a pro or not, but I think generally a lot of people consider that to be a pro. Um, if you are using a demonstrator pen, I think pistons show off the ink a lot better in a demonstrator. It just looks cooler. You see it sloshing around more. You know, you're not having to view it basically through like a double wall, you know? So it's like, even if you have a, a say a Lamy Vista or something like that, where it's a it's a clear pen that also has a converter. You can see the ink in there, but it's not nearly as cool. But it's got an ink like window. It's like Eco. It does have an ink window. I guess you got like triple ink viewing capability on a Vista. Um, but I think the demonstrator versions of a piston show off the ink much more better. Or even just having an ink window, um, you see the ink you know, a little more clearly than you would um, on, a, on a converter. Uh, and then the piston is already included with the pen. So you don't really have to worry about extra accessories and stuff like that. You know, you don't really have to worry about in the cleaning process, you know, taking out a converter and possibly losing it, breaking it, anything like that. Um, you know, so that's kind of nice. No, no additional accessories to really worry about. Um, and then cartridge converter pros. So they're usually less expensive, slightly more economical, you know, um, and uh, the part can be replaced. So the converter itself can be replaced if you do damage it. I mean, it's usually those, the converters are not made as well as durably as a natively built-in piston. So yes, you can replace it and stuff like that, which if you're using like one pen a lot, the piston will hold up better over time and then you don't have to worry about replacing any you know parts like you might on a cartridge converter. But the nice thing about the cartridge converter is you can just buy another converter and stick it on there and it's kind of easy to deal with that. Um, also, you can use cartridges. So you get kind of a dual format if you're using a converter as opposed to a piston. Piston, you have to use bottled ink. You don't have any option to use cartridges unless you ink syringe it out of there and siphon it in there as possible. But I don't know anybody who does that really. Um, so you can get some additional versatility and convenience depending on how you like to use the pen. Um, and then I would say that it's probably easier to clean. Now it's a little extra step because you do have to clean the converter separately. And it's not necessarily Sorry. easier. No, you're good. It's not necessarily easier if you are, just flushing, you know, using the little converter because it's like it doesn't move nearly as much ink through that the pen. It takes so long. That's really annoying. Yeah. But if you add the bulb syringe and you do it that way, it's a lot easier. You can technically on some pens, 
You can take out the piston mechanism and flush it with a bulb syringe on a piston filling pen. Not every pen is as ideal for that. Yeah. So it's kind of more of a hack than it is like an actual, it's like a it's like a double layered hack. You have to hack the bulb syringe and you have to be able to hack into the pen. So it's not for everybody, but I do that on a lot of my pens. The, uh, the regular ink syringe can really clean out a converter quickly too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like you really just blast just it out. Just kind of blast it out, yeah. yeah. I usually just like kind of suck a little ink up in there and I put my thumb over the hole of the converter and I just shake it like crazy and then dump it out. And that Got does it. a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. It really gets, you know, cause there's like some like the Lamy that have like that little like whatever plug or whatever the heck is inside that converter and kind of like hang up in the back of that thing. So I don't know, I'm in the pros of the converter section here talking about how hard it is to clean out that converter. But honestly, it takes like five seconds yeah, to shake out the converter. It's, it's really not bad. I've had piston filling pens where I've had to like flush and 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 flush. And flush and flush and flush and flush wow, and flush. Wow, there's yeah, lots of some crannies of them, and nooks in those there things. There is, yeah. And if you're like me and don't maybe clean your pens <gasps> as often as you should, oh. pistons are, are a little more of a pain. Whereas converters, you know, you just take it off, bulb syringe it, and you're pretty good to go. So, you know, those are some of my, my pros for each of them. I don't think there's any one right answer. I think it all just boils down to personal preference and which you like better. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think they both got their merits. I, I personally prefer cartridge converter. I think the versatility is more applicable for how I use fountain pens. Mm. And I am a serial sampler, so I am always switching up inks. I'm always finding new inks I want to try. So mm. I, it would be more difficult for me to try and justify trying more inks if I had all of that ink still in a internal piston pen. I would end up mm. wasting inks and I don't want to do that. So yeah, car car uh, converter makes sense for me. And honestly, I sometimes just even half fill those uh, because mm. I'm just always ready for the next color. Now, when you fill your pens, whether it's a piston or a converter, are you defaulting to like trying to max out the fill? No, no, no I don't care about maxing out the fill at all. Do you, do you like, just fill and then that's it? Or do you fill flush, fill again? I usually- And try and like- It, it depends. At least try and get as much as you can without having to like tip it upside down or use it depends on the ink. or something crazy. Um, it depends on the ink. If I, if I am like trying, like I've got Celadon Cat in my pilot here mm -hmm. and that one I didn't fill all the way okay. because I wasn't sure about that one. It okay. looked a little light to me. Mm. And I didn't know how practical it was going to be. So You're with that one, sort of hedging yourself. Yeah, with that one, I did a half yeah. fill. Um, but if it, if I know, if it's like you know a, a blue or something that I'm like, I'm gonna write with this thing a lot. I know it's gonna look mm. good. I haven't written with it yet, so I'm still curious. But I'll do a full fill on that one, or like I'll do what you talk about, and like you know, yeah. fill, dump, pull again. Yeah, yeah. That's like an extra five seconds. Yeah, just you yeah. know, Why not? seems like the right thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Question number one. two. Yeah, this is from Caitlin Swigart, a many time asker here on the Pencast. Yeah. Uh, when I first started purchasing from Goulet, it was all ink art. Now we have gorgeous digital art related to fountain pens. Who are your artists and what made you decide to start putting stickers as freebies? Is there a process to making new stickers or do they come as organically as they have in this podcast? Yeah. Um, to... So like end. starting at the back, yeah. uh, they do come organically. Um, you know, uh, they're, uh, for whatever reason, I've, I've kind of taken that on um, as far as coming up with, with new stuff. Uh, first one I did were Angela He's art. So Angela mm -hmm. is Inky Converters on Instagram. And I had seen her art for a while and I just really, really loved it. I think uh, her raccoon was the first one I saw. That's like kind of her trademark. And I was just like, can we please do something with her? So mm. uh, we worked with her and she developed our Corgi, our hamster, and there are two bottles of ink and they look fantastic. So those are uh, currently available. So that was just one, you know, I had stumbled upon and yeah. really wanted to do something with her art because it's just adorable and lovely. Um, and then let's see, we had that discussion about um, whether or not you're a nib chameleon on one episode of the pen cast. Right. And uh, being, if you don't care about nib sizes, if you can just write with anything and enjoy them all equally, you're a, you know, hypothetical nib chameleon. And that just kind of, the term just seemed very visual to me. So we had talked mm. about it and we're like, yeah, we could get a, somebody to design a chameleon on top of a nib or something like that. And I just thought about that chameleon look and I knew that Hey Matthew's artwork would really look good with that. Now, Matthew is a busy guy, so I wasn't sure that um, he was gonna be able to do this one. But in fact, he 
did this in like just a couple days. Wow. Um, and it looked hit it, just hit it, at the right time there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that looked fantastic. It looked every bit as good as I hoped it would. And those cool. are currently still available as well. So uh, Hey Matthews art is really unique. Um, he's got a very, very signature design style to the stuff that, you know, he makes, but he's also a professional, you know, designer, so he can do stuff in a multitude of styles, but he's super talented and a great guy. Um, and then uh, one of our more recent ones, uh, Talis Medeiros, he had, we had actually already been selling one of Talis's pieces of art in the form of a rickshaw uh, six roll or eight roll with the mm. Mount Fuji and a platinum 3776 on top of it. And I didn't know that at the time, but then oh. I had started following him on Instagram because I saw all these uh, Pokemon pieces of digital art that he had paired with these, um, I guess, Japanese releases of these Lamy pens that were mm. like a Charmander, a Bulbasaur, a Pikachu, and a Squirtle. Mm. Uh, and I started following him and, you know, reached out to him about maybe doing something for us for our Northern Lights Sailor exclusive for 2023. And we did that. He drew uh, this just phenomenal polar bear with his little map exploring the Northern Lights, a little backpack, and the pens kind of floating above him with the Northern Lights in the background. Like that, Just it just... So I got super excited about that. And um, while that sticker is only available if you buy a Northern Lights blue pen from us, uh, I'm sure that we'll work with him again at some point because his, his stuff looks phenomenal. He's a yeah. truly, truly uh, gifted artist and a uh, bunch of stuff. Uh, he is, um, I don't know how to pronounce his Instagram tag, but I'll link it in the description. It's like Ontalrod or something like that. I don't know how to say it. I should ask him, but I'll link it so you can look at more of his stuff as well. Um, and then Mary, Mary Nye, she, uh, I met last year at the San Francisco pen show. Mm. Um, she had given her, given me one of uh, her original pieces. Um, I had it back here for a second. I think I moved it, but, um, I, uh, hung on to that. And then when we had the opportunity to do some more stickers, I asked if, um, she could do them. And we did the Starfall picture and the, uh, Sakura picture. Mm. Um, both those were turned into stickers. And uh, she's got a really, really unique art style as well. And those we decided to do in a more, not straight up holographic print, but you know, it's a more of a vapor wave finish to them. So mm. they're a little shiny, which just her art's just kind of shiny art. Yeah. Um, this is conducive to that. Very styling, conducive yeah. to shiny. And then she actually uh, also designed our new brochure that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And in that brochure, she created these two characters, uh, a little fountain pen and a little bottle of ink. Mm -hmm. And uh, the customer care team, you know, lovingly referred to them as Nub and Fred. Yes. Because there um, <laughs> had been some confusion at some point, some auto correct, uh, corrected um, pen to... No, no, nib, nib, no, nib, nib and, and feed. feed yeah. Corrected nib and feed to Nub and Fred. And so they just thought that was hilarious. And that's just been kind of an inside joke. And then so we're like, you know what? This one's Nub and this one's Fred. So uh, we loved them so much. We took those characters from the brochure and we're going to make a sticker with Nub and Fred on them as well. So I'll mention them again once they're for sale, but that'll be coming down the pipeline. Um, and more stuff from Mary will be coming down the pipeline as well because she's so good. Uh, we're having her do some Lamy pens, or not Lamy pens, Lamy inspired pens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> with the most adorable little dragons on them. So there's 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 like pen horde with a dragon guarding its little pen trio there. And then uh, the grail pen design, which is a dragon lovingly embracing um, a grail pen. And uh, really excited. Those should be here uh, probably in a couple of weeks, you know, maybe a week out. They've been ordered, so they're on their way, but um, those will be available as well. And all of these, I don't know about all of them, most of these are available in both larger prints that you can buy and little mm -hmm. tiny freebies that we would include in your order. I don't think that we're not doing freebies on the Nib Chameleon. And uh, obviously, like I said, um, the Polar Bear is only available with the purchase of a, purchase of a pen, but uh, these new ones from Mary, we're gonna do both. So you'll be able to get a holographic one that's larger that you pay for, and then maybe a little teeny one that's not holographic that you could find included in your order. Mm -hmm. As far as when we started doing stickers, I don't recall, but- It was a while ago. We did, um, like Caitlin said, we did have like some original art that some of our team members at the time had done. Um, and we had yeah, those in orders like, for a long time. It started off it with cards. Organic. It was pretty organic, yeah, because we had, we had um, we were doing handwritten thank you letters for the longest time mm -hmm. in orders. And then we changed, 
it from being just like letters or like notes on like a paper invoice that we would include or a paper receipt, I guess, um, to doing cards. And then we put the artwork on the cards. Right. Just to but make then, the cards look more interesting. Yeah. But then as we moved away from doing the handwritten note in every order thing, it was like, well, we still have this artwork and we still like to do it. So we kind of all like, what if we Because people liked the car- the cards, you know. We, yeah, they did. We sold them separately for a little while, but the sales on those really dropped off. Yeah. But yeah. the art was appealing. So yeah, we did, we did. That was, it was kind of like a way like, okay, well, how can we still have, you know, fun value to our customers? Yeah, there's still this artwork. It's like, it shows what can be done with some of the ink, mm-hmm. you know, but it's like, we're not doing the handwritten note thing anymore, mm-hmm. which, you know, that was years ago. So, so we, we transitioned kind of from cards to stickers. Well, and then stickers were like becoming a more popular thing. We'd see them like a lot of people had yeah. them at pen shows. And so it was kind of like an water organic, bottles being covered by. Yeah, it was just kind like of an organic, you know, kind of a trending thing of yeah. sorts. You know, it's a big thing among YouTubers to have stickers and mm-hmm. these types of things, trade them with other people and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it just kind of evolved naturally right. over That's time. Right. So makes sense now. none of this has been like a strict plan. No, of any no, kind. God, no. It's, it's pretty much has been like very, or, the whole process has really been quite organic. Yeah. And some of it is like we just had some artistic people on our team and it was like, you know, we would make stuff for trending things that were on Instagram or whatever. And, you know, as trends have come and gone and co- certain types of content we've produced have done better and then worse. And, you know, we'll put more or less effort into some of these things. Um, nowadays, it's like static images on Instagram just don't do as well. We don't no. have quite as many people internally who are as artistic and stuff like that, wanting to produce all this art all the time. So we just aren't producing as much of yeah. that type of artwork. So for us, you know, a few years ago, it was kind of like, well, We've always like done a lot of the artwork, you know, internally with our team. But what if we open up and feature more of the artwork of other people in the community? So it wasn't so much of necessarily a desire to like move away from physical ink and to go digital. I guess now look in retrospect, that is somewhat of what's happened, but that's not been like the specific plan. It's more just been, you know, a way for us to collaborate with others in the community. And then, you know, we yeah. kind of worked with whatever medium they've done. So, But every, every artist, working. every artist on here is an active user of fountain pens. For sure. So, so like, you know, while the finished product is a digital piece, mm-hmm. uh, it's very, very likely that it was conceived and sketched using a fountain pen. Yeah. So I don't know it all kind of mashes together into like, you know, just one big thing of whatever trends and makes sense and is part of the community and all that, you know, that's going to ebb and flow and I'm sure it'll change over time. You know, we've been doing this 14 years now, so definitely we're going to look back and be like, oh yeah, that, there were definitely different trends that were happening at different periods of, of this business. Yeah. And um, Kate Caitlin yeah. herself um, conceived of a, you know, a, now Barney the Barnacle sticker has since been retired, but you know, she came up with, you know, the, uh, the concept of that sticker as well. So who knows where they can come from? Yeah. But yeah, a little, little backstory there. So appreciate the question. Yeah. All right. All right. Coming to us from also friend of the show, Captain Quark. Okay. If you could have another Lamy 2000 special edition with a different color mm. or material, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. Hmm. I do like me some Lamy 2000s. It, it, this is known. Uh, I've talked about it once or twice before. Um, so... Little backstory here because they have not, they've not really had them regularly available or publicized them very much because the limited editions have been pretty limited in terms of the Lamy 2000, especially over the life of the pen. Um, so they have the black and they have the stainless steel versions as the regular editions. So those you can get, you know, pretty much anytime you want. In the, if my memory serves me correctly, and I realize we have not done like a blog article or anything on the history of the Lamy 2000 like no I would they be haven't, curious they haven't to been read like, that one they haven't been like special editions or anything like they've done with like the studios and mm-hmm. the all star and the safari and all that they've been a lot more just like boop like pop here up there everywhere um, but now that I've kind of made a list of them I was like they actually have done a kind of a few of them now um, so they've already done a dark blue that was I think was I'm not going to say it. they did a they did a 2000 anniversary that was edition the Bauhaus blue right the Bauhaus blue, that was what, like six years ago, something like that. It was relatively recently. So all of these are relatively recent. They did a they did a year 2000, Lamy 2000, that was just a slightly different version of the polycarbonate and stainless. Mm. It looked a little bit different. It might've had like a red dot or something in the finial. I can't remember. I don't, that, that one I don't have, but you can see maybe some pictures online of that one, but it didn't look 
that different than a regular Lamy 2000. It was not like a totally different color. The first one they did that was the different color that I can remember was the blue, the Bauhaus blue. So that one, I don't remember what year it was, but it was, I don't know, a few years ago. Uh, then they did the black amber, or did the black amber come first? That was a metal. That came first. That came first? Yeah. Okay. That, we were in the old that space when that came first. Okay, yeah, you're right. You're the blue right. one was here in the current space. But the black amber, that was an all metal pen. It was still Lamy 2000, but it mm -hmm. wasn't like a different color of the polycarbonate. Yeah. So that one, you know, does that count or not? I don't know. But that was like a brownish metal mm -hmm. kind of pen. Nice looking pen, but so heavy. It's just so heavy. But I liked it because it had like the copper, uh, like copper plated trim, or I don't know if it was copper, but like an amber yeah, it was like, yeah. trim to it. And it was like shiny and interesting. Yeah. So it was, it, it was cool, but I like the the polycarbonate. Um, the polycarbonate, so they, the, they had the blue and then they also did a brown one. Mm -hmm. So did you keep those, one of the brown ones? I do have a brown one as well. Good. Yeah. Good man. It's hard because they're so much more expensive mm -hmm. than the regular and it's like, I mean, they that one I think like came with a book and it, it was, was like a huge box. Came with like a big box and yeah. everything, but still, it was like I think it was like five hundred dollars or something. The blue one was five hundred. Whereas the normal is like two hundred. It's, it's like, is Crazy it worth pants. two and a half times the price? Nope. Uh, it was for me because I paid for it. So, <laughs> um, and a few others did too. But you know, still, it's like ah, kind of crazy. So. I'm going with like the polycarbonate version. So like the blue or the yeah, brown one. Yeah. Um, I think it would be cool if they did one that's like a dark teal, like the petrol. Oh, Like that kind yeah. of a color. I think that would look. Oh God, they so wouldn't be good. able to stock enough of those. Right, wouldn't that be good? Oh my God, yeah. That's probably my number one pick. I, yeah. I think that would look phenomenal. That would that would break I the think, internet. Yeah, I think it would have to be a dark color. Like, cause if you go with something too crazy, I think it would just look just really out of place, especially mm -hmm. cause like that pen is like so Bauhaus. Like that yeah. is like the defining like Lamy design pen in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So you can't go too crazy with that color because then it really just, it jumps the shark. It just mm -hmm. gets away from what it's supposed to be. So I was actually shocked that they did and that they did any color because like for a while it's, it seemed like they were never gonna make any different color. So the blue and the brown, although they were very dark and subtle, were actually pretty wild in you know, like the canon of Lamy, right? Um, so I think petrol would be amazing. Or I think a dark purple, like the Lamy dark lilac, Safari, like that dark, maybe have some like black black trim on it too. Oh, that'd be, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. That'd be really cool. Don't get excited about any of these because I doubt any of these would ever happen, yeah. but it is exciting to think about. Or maybe, maybe a dark green. Now, Lamy with dark green with us has been very hit or miss. So I don't know about that one. But I do think that would be kind of cool. So again, I'm just kind of going like straight polycarbonate, same material and everything. So these are like my more conservative choices of like, if Lamy's listening, like I think we could actually sell these and it would be very interesting and accepted. And then we'll get into some like wilder stuff that I'm like, yeah, they would never make it out of this, but it would be pretty fun. So anyway, those are the three colors that like maybe I could see, but the, the petrol and the dark light, like for sure, I think would be unbelievable. Yeah. I think that'd be amazing. <clears throat> Metal versions of it? I don't know, because you could go kind of like the route that they have with the studio, like kind of that, because that was the, the um, what was it called? The dark amber or black amber, I think is what it's called, that brown one. Um, I think that, that that had that kind of like Lamy All-Star-ish type of like anodized, you know, kind of like a matte, not fully shiny, but like a matte finish to it yeah. that kind of glowed a little bit. Um, I think you could go with a color like that. But if you remember the, um, copper orange all-star i think a like a, a darker like burnt orange in a metal lamy 2000 would look pretty awesome or like a, a petrol in that i color think too the burnt really orange good. crossed my mind because it looks really retro yeah like old carpet yeah yeah I and think that, that and that copper that copper orange all-star is like one of my favorites mm -hmm. it just looks so i think it's that would look nailed good. that color um but yeah i think a petrol too would also look really good or like um, do you remember the, uh, I think it was called the racing green from like 2019. They did in a studio. Studio, yep. It was like green, but it had like a little bit of a hint of a red sheen to it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a lot of those pens. So not a lot of people actually got them in their hands, but that one looked really good. I think that would look pretty awesome in a Lamy 2002. So anything in that like kind of dark vibe, I think would look great. The orange is kind of the wildest one I think would, would practically kind of work for that yeah. pen. Um, I'm not sure if this would work. So this one's getting a little more out there. Yeah. But I think like a translucent demo pen. Yeah. Because there's like cool stuff going on. It's like that pen. There's like cool technology in there. Oh, that's, of course that would work. Why wouldn't that work? I don't know. It just, 
this is where I'm trying to like visualize in my mind. Like obviously it would work, like it would look, but I'm like, would that even look like a Lamy 2000 anymore? I don't oh. know. Mm. I don't know if it would like change it too much. Yeah. Like part of me wants it and part of me is like, no, that just wouldn't feel oh, like okay. the same I thought thing. you were like, so maybe like it wouldn't physically work. Oh, physically it would work. Okay, yeah, because yeah. it's just, you know, I would assume you could make a clear polycarbonate. Yeah, no, imagine, that, no like, people are making p clear yeah. polycarbonate pens right now. Yeah, so you could do it. But then, so what I don't know specifically about that, like there's the aesthetic of it, would that kind of work? I think it would, I think it would look awesome. It wouldn't, yeah, it would definitely look very unlike look a Lobby 2000, but it would look yeah, cool. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure it felt that way when, you know, Pelican did their first demonstrator. You know, it's like you had the like M600, M800 like, and it was just like, obviously going demonstrator looks entirely different. But then you look at it and you're like, yeah, that looks amazing. It would probably be like that. It's like, that'd be kind of weird. The only thing I'm not sure about, because when they do the polycarbonate on the Lamy 2000, it's all brushed. That would really change like the look of the translucency of it. You would so, want to keep it brushed? I don't know. Mm. That's That's where I'm not sure how I feel about it. Cause aesthetically, I think it would look amazing if it was like highly polished and you could just see straight through, polish the inside too, oh, yeah. and just have it be like super crisp and clean looking. But then part of it too, like if you brush it, it would have kind of a frosted look, which would also be cool. But if you have, if you then have a clear pen that's also smooth, I'm like, would that even feel like a Lamy 2000 in my hands anymore? Like the, I don't know, I don't know if the weight, I guess the weight wouldn't be any different if it's the same material but then you still have the stainless grip or do you go all polycarbonate? I don't know, there's just like, it's, these are little things we're talking about here, but it feels like so, such a big change. Yeah. Like I can only imagine at Lamy just like, especially cause that pen's been made since 1966 with very little changes. I'm sure any conversation they have about like any of these things seems like such a deviation from the canon of, you know, Lamy design. I'm sure it's just, Stuff must get talked about for years before anything ever happens. I'm sure it gets shut down very quickly. Probably, yeah. probably. Cause it's just, it would change the look so much. I don't know. So a translucent demo would be super interesting or even like a clear demo or like even a translucent color. I have no idea which colors would actually work for it. But I mean, certainly a dark teal, I'm into that. Any blue, obviously I'm super into that. A dark purple, I think would look amazing. These would all look great. Not yellow. Stay away from yellow. Brown. I'm not a fan of translucent yellows. Translucent brown. A23. You could do that. You could yeah. do that. You'd have to call it amber, but mm. you know, then, don't like then the it would be brown, acceptable. Apparently. Yeah. It's gotta be amber. <laughs> That's right. Um, so that would be kind of cool. Um, what about like a celluloid or like a hard rubber, like an ebonite? Sure. That to me would feel kind of fitting. You know, it would. It would. It would definitely change the look of it quite a bit. I don't think ebonite. If but it was still, black ebonite, I don't think it would look different enough it may not look it may not look different enough yeah and then i mean like, if it was yeah if then you, if you do brushed then it wouldn't it would look exactly the same well it would look it would look similar but if you do a brushed i don't think it would work quite as well I've never seen brushed ebonite before i think probably for a reason like i don't <laughs> think it like it would probably smell much stronger if oh, you yeah. did agitating that yeah ebonite funk and then what happens with ebonite or hard rubber depending on how trademarked <laughs> right it is um that we did, we did a, I'm trying, was it ebonite or resin? I know we did a, a matte black resin in the original premiere that we did with Edison. Like the satin years black. ago. Yeah, that was, that it was, was a satin resin. black. It was only around for a little bit, but you know, that that's a more hard wearing material than the ebonite uh, in some ways. But even that, if you like just the friction from your hands, like really on any matte pen, not so much on matte metal, but any matte resin that you do, with friction just from your fingers over and over and over and over and over again, it will polish up mm -hmm. and it'll make it shiny. Just like you can always tell which keys you use on your keyboard the most because they get kind of shiny just from your fingers rubbing it all the time. I feel like that would be even worse on like an, an ebonite pen. Oh yeah, well just look at anybody who's had a black matte vanishing point for a number of years and it gets heavily used. Yeah. They're not and matte that's, anymore. And that's metal too. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know, but I guess it's the same as any other ebonite pen. But if it's, if it's already a polished ebonite, you won't really notice because your fingers are not changing it much. But if you had like a mat or a brushed, I feel like that would stand out and that would maybe not hold up as well over mm -hmm. time. So I, I'm less convinced about Ebonite, but I do think it would be interesting. Um, and then my kind of wild one out there would be to have like a forged carbon version of a Lamy 2000. I feel like that would look crazy and I have no idea how you would actually even make that, but I think it would look Aesthetically, it would look wild. It would look cool. That would look really cool. So I would be into that.
I don't know how they would make that, but it would be I mean, cool. I don't know how anybody uses it. So yeah. if they can make it into a mystery filler, why not? Why yeah. not a 2000? Or maybe, all right, for the Ebonite, maybe if you Urushi lacquer it. That was going to be mine. Yeah. I was going to say Urushi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely Urushi. That would Arushi. be awesome. That would oh, be cool. yeah. That would be cool. 100% Urushi. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of Rushi? Just straight black, or would, I would you go want, something wilder? I would. I would want one of those, like you know, black with red highlights around the edges. Oh yeah, yeah. I forget what style that's called. I don't know. It's like the red is the underlayer, and it gets mm-hmm. polished out to yeah. you know, but just just where where cool. it connects, like where the bottom of the cap is, and mm-hmm. 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also concrete, concrete, concrete pen, like oh. actual concrete. That a concrete two thousand. Like what? What says more? Well, that, huh. that's that's super German. That would be pretty. That's uh, super fitting to the style. Are there concrete pens out there? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any major manufacturers are making them, but you've seen yeah. them like independent makers. Yeah, that, that's how uh, that's how Ben Walsh from Gravitas started making pens. Huh? Concrete. Yeah, because like I know concrete's an alternative for like various types of furniture yeah. and yeah. like smaller craft items and stuff like that. Yeah, you can do it. Huh? Interesting. Concrete two thousand man home run. Wow. Grand Slam, Cowbunga, Pizza Time. If you drop it, does it like break? I don't drop like it. How durable? Well, I mean, I don't drop it. That's also lava. <laughs> Let's go. Lava resin. Let's go to yeah. Mount Etna. That makes sense. You know, yeah. d- dress up of course. as a, dress up as one of those Visconti. Of course that would be amazing. Drop dress up as one of those Visconti lava picker uppers, and you know, just put on a fake mustache. Hop, hop. <laughs> Get in there, get your bucket of lava. That's right. And then go back to Lonnie and be like, hey guys, guess what I got? I got some, I got some <laughs> lava. I got some lava. That would be cool. Yeah. I would be into that. Yeah. I would be into that. Why not? How about wood? Would a Lonnie 2000 make sense in wood? Ebony? Ebony wood. That'd be kind of cool. No, I think it Black needs wood. to look really kind of uh, mid century modern and go with like a, a light grain wood paneling sort of style. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I don't know about that. I don't know if that would work for me. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Some nice. Okay. Some, some pine paneling. Okay. I mean, we're dreaming here because none of, <laughs> we're never going to see any of this, but it's fun to dream. It's yeah. It's fun to dream not? every now and then. All right. Drew, I got a question for you okay. from Dang Keneal. Dang, am I saying this right? Dan G. Keneal, maybe? Or Dang Keneal? Whatever. Um, sorry for mispronouncing it. Dan. Dang. Great nib with average pen body mm-hmm. or great pen body with average nib performance. Okay, so like. Hypothetical, I guess this is like a hypothetical. Like okay. which, Drew and I interpreted this question two different ways, but it's his question, so I'm gonna let him take it the direction that he will. Sounds like Dang Canyon <laughs> saying, great nib with average pen body or great body with average nib. So kind of taking. Like which you know, would you choose? Yeah, which do you like, prefer? Which you prefer, which do you choose, what do you think is better? Etc. Mm. So it would, it depends. I have both. I have quite a few of mm. both. I have some really really cool looking pens, the expensive pens, and the nibs kind of just eh. It's it's all it's okay. It's all sizzle no steak, you know. Mm. And but yet I tolerate them. Now I will say I've been getting a lot of them worked on and working on them myself, and mm. you know i have fewer so than raising, i used to raising the bar on yeah them. so i am making them better but mm. i i used to have quite a few of them okay. and but yet i would tolerate them because they were super swanky looking and mm. i'd have one on the page and they'd be giving me a hard time and i say you know what that's all right you're pretty so <laughs> i get that and i think there's merit to that i mm-hmm. think that as long as it's bringing you joy and it's and you're not just mad at it all the time if you can look down it's kind of like a corgi it's <laughs> it's it's a it's a horrible beast from hell but if you if you look at it <laughs> You're like, you know what? I love you because you're just a cutie patootie little cuddle mm, pie. Mm. And that's 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 their self-defense mechanism. Mm. That's how mm-hmm. they get through life. Mm-hmm. So, so pens can be like that. You, okay. you, you can, they okay. can be giving you a hard time, but then you look at them, you're like, oh, I love you though. And that's that. Mm. And, and you go, go about your merry business. Um, I think we all have pens like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. it happens. But then, you, of course, you've got the ones that are just not attractive at all but are always there for you and always mm-hmm. right. And I've had a dog like that as well. I'm sorry. Mm. Um, Katie was a, just a, I love her to death, but she was not a pretty dog. Mm. Um, but uh, always came when you called, never had to worry about her. Mm-hmm. Good, good, good dog. Mm. Uh, let's say an example of that would be, I don't know, the Pilot Kakuno comes to mind. I don't think that's a particularly attractive pen, but at 14 bucks, it writes so super well for yeah. what you're getting. And it writes better than pens that Great I've man. had that yeah. are in the hundreds of dollars as far as value hmm. goes. So 
Love oh, that. Got pen. Such a, they got such a solid steel nib. They do. That's why they use it on they do. everything. They've got a solid yeah. everything except for converters. Um, but if you were to ask me, if you were to ask me what I would prefer, would I rather if I just had one pen and I could pick a swanky swanky pen yeah, that it has really a came down to it questionable writing experience or a solid writing experience with a meh body style? I will go with the solid writing experience with the mm. meh body style. Yeah, because ultimately what it comes down to is are you enjoying the writing experience? Yeah. Is is the writing experience bringing you joy? Like that's what gets people into the fountain pen hobby. It's not just like looking at pens. It's getting it mm. on paper and discovering that the actual writing adventure is new and exciting and interesting and limitless in a lot of ways. Um, that's what draws you in. That's where the passion begins. And then you learn more about aesthetics and what sort of style you like to look at as you're enjoying the actual writing. Mm -hmm. The looks have to be secondary. Like, unless you are just going to set them up on a, you know, display or something, um, I would definitely pick the nib over mm. the uh, the look. If I had to pick, ideally, you know, you'd want both. But mm. uh, you know, that's not always going to be delivered. In an ideal world, it would be. But yeah, I'm going to go Yeah, uh, great nib, average pen body. Yeah, I think I'm kind of in a similar boat. You know, now my, my pen collection is extensive and I'm not using nearly as many pens as I am just looking at pens and referencing them. Mm. So a case could be made to where having really nice looking pens could be something I care more about. But you're in a very interesting position, though. I'm in a unique position, but even a less extreme version of what I've got going on. Like anybody who's been a you know an intentional acquirer mm -hmm. of writing instruments over a 14 year period or longer is probably going to acquire more pens than they're realistically going to use yeah. on a regular basis. Some and, people get there within two years. Well, that is wonderful if that's what fills your tank and i fully support that of course obviously um but also it's like i don't know they are kind of made to write so it's like kind of it kind of makes sense <laughs> i don't know i think about like for whatever reason like cars come to mind which is probably a terrible example because cars are way less practical to like actually collect um and there's so many different functions of a car besides you know what you would just have with a pen but i guess like there's people that collect cars and have multiple of them and you can only drive one car at a time you know so it's like do you care more about like the driving experience or do you care more about other you know historical aspects or unique rare things or you just like a car because of the way that it looks but it maybe doesn't drive great um i think about like one of like some of the cars that i grew up like you know idolizing as a child like the dodge viper and mm -hmm. stuff like that Apparently, it's like not a great car to drive and own and stuff like that. And a lot of like supercars are actually really expensive and a huge pain to maintain. So like that. So like as a driving experience, like they give you a thrill, but they're actually just a huge pain. Mm. But they kind of look amazing. And, you know, there's an emotional component to it. You know, I think it's a, a similar argument could be made there. Sure. I think really it could go either way. Um, but I don't know. I'm kind of a little more on the spot here because I actually interpreted this question a little differently than Drew. Um, so I think for me, yeah, the, the the performance of the pen obviously matters quite a bit. Like for me, the initial draw into fountain pens was because like even a even a very mediocre pen, which was like I made a a pen out of a pen kit from like my pen making days and used like the stock fountain pen nib, which was a no name, whatever, who knows what steel nib out of there. And that was still like the greatest writing experience I ever had coming off of ballpoints and rollerballs. So like even a pretty average nib is pretty great compared to most other writing instruments, um, you know, except maybe some of the best of what's out there in, in other formats. Um, so yeah, but once I expanded my, my experience of nib writing, that was like my whole early first few years of fountain pens was like really focusing solely on the nib. So. I would say that's probably more important, especially if you're newer into the hobby. And then just like after you have a whole bunch and you're used to them and you have some good go-tos, then it gets more fun and like the aesthetic, yeah. you know, and then it's more interesting. And yeah, because at that point, you know what you like, you know what you're going to continue to go back to. You yeah. can pick up some stuff just for fun. And it's kind of like once you use some some really good nibs that write reliably, it's not like it's not like the experience of a good writing nib gets continually like better over time. 
I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but it's like once you have a really good like nibs and, and pens you really enjoy writing with, it's not like the more you spend and the deeper and the more you, you get into it, you get that much more benefit. Like there's a law of diminishing returns when it comes to like nib quality. But when it comes to like really nice pen bodies and interesting things like that, there's there's a lot deeper chasm that you can go into in terms of that stuff. So that's maybe where I could say like over time, you may actually kind of flip that where it's like, well, I've got a bunch of really decent writing pens, but the more interesting aspects of it now is the body and the design and the more aesthetic elements of it. So for sure, that's maybe kind of a little more where I'm at these days, but I agree with that. you know, I definitely like, I will get distracted with a subpar nib. But I also like, I know how to like tweak them and fix them a little more. Yeah. So it's like, it also doesn't bother me and quite as much. the more you write, the more you are able to quickly adapt and kind of like listen to how the pen yeah. is behaving. Like a pen's gotta be like pretty subpar for me to like not enjoy writing yeah. with it. Like an average nib, I still enjoy quite a bit because yeah. an average fountain pen writing experience is still a really good writing experience to yes. me. Um, but I had a couple of pens, like I interpreted the question more as like, what are some pens that have a great nib with that average pen body and then the reverse of that? So I listed out a few. So I'll just I'll just name a couple because I think are particularly like poignant to my example. So like to me, like the Diplomat Magnum, the body of that pen is not like amazing to me. Like it's fine, but it's kind of light. You know, it's kind of interesting design, but it's not like a pen that I think is like wowing most people just because of the way that it looks. But the nib on that thing is like, whoa, this is a really great nib for a pen in this price range. So that's one to me that stands out. You mentioned the Kakuno. Um, I think Twisby has a couple pens that go, arguably maybe the swipe may not be everybody's aesthetic, you know, go-to, but the nibs are great and they write pretty well. Um, but I think like the Pilot Varsity might be one of the best examples of this because it's a sub $4, whatever, $4 pen or around, right around there. The body itself is not at all fantastic, but the nib writes so well for what it is, it's always kind of a surprise. And I would put the Pilot Parallel kind of in that category too. That's more of an obscure pen, but. Um, and then, you know, the pens that have like a great body, but kind of an average nib, I kind of feel this way about like the Pelican M200, the steel nib mm -hmm. pen, like the body of the pen, the build is great, very solid, the piston feels amazing, but the nib is kind of just a regular steel nib. And it's like, yeah. it's not bad, but it's not like, blowing my mind yeah you know what i mean no i think that's a great example so i think that's a good one and then um i kind of feel that way about like some of the Quaco pens too like the Quaco all sports mm -hmm. like the bodies are amazing yeah but the nibs are like i mean they're fine but they like they're overshadowed by yeah how great the it's the same is. nib you get on like the yeah. entry level yeah those. and like pretty much anything Jin Hao kind of fits in that category too like the bodies like the dragon is a yeah. incredible you know and other things like that but then the nib is usually like yeah mm. okay it's there as long as it works right that's kind of what you expect but or it's as long as it's easily pen. replaceable yeah exactly so anyway those are some ones i had in mind but i honestly enjoy all, all types just like you do yeah awesome all right all right come uh, one more bringing us home is justice pace mm. and justice is saying in recent years, I've noticed a particular uptick again with minimalism and ethical mm. consumption. Oh. Being retailers, how do y'all personally feel about that? Has it impacted Goulet at all? Mm. I try not to make frequent purchases myself in an effort to save money and space in my home, but mm. it's still a passion and I still do consume. Hmm. Very interesting question. Good question. Yeah, yeah. I, think this, I think this topic comes up, you know, I don't have any like hard data around any of this, so I'll just be pontificating for most of this. Um, I think this comes up it never really leaves the conversation when it comes to fountain pens. Cause I feel like fountain pens themselves fall into a category of products that are kind of conducive, you know, in some ways to a minimalist lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly it's like- And a, a, a like a, um, a waste conscious lifestyle as well. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. I mean, I know you can like with any collectible type of hobby or, you know, one could argue like just write things digitally and don't use a pen at all. And then that's not as wasteful. I mean, sure, okay. but. Um, you know, certainly it's, it's, there's a lot less disposability in the fountain pen, you know, in terms of a physical writing instrument than maybe other, other categories. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there's always been, I haven't, I haven't kept up with like the trend of minimalism, um, as a definition, but I feel like I became aware of it after I got into the fountain pen world, you know, maybe a decade or so ago, it was a term that I was a lot more aware of and, you know, things like everyday carry and minimalist and these types of things. Um, and there may be other terms in there too that I can think of, but basically the idea of like, you have one really good thing, you know, one really good bag, one really good 
water bottle, one really good pen, one really good, you know, watch, you know, things like that. Like you minimalize the, the products that you use in your life and try to keep to that. I definitely think fountain pens can be a part of that for, you know, there's an intentionality around that kind of lifestyle in like buying decisions that I think fountain pens can fit into. So I've never really felt like we've been in conflict with that necessarily. Um, in terms of like, you know, whatever that is a, as a lifestyle. Um, but you know, for sure we live in the U S and we are a for-profit company that is selling things in a largely consumer based society, which I guess is the whole, what minimalism is kind of fighting. Right. And I personally, you know, kind of, well, I kind of straddle that line. Right. Cause it's like, we're a for-profit company and we, you know, in many ways benefit from people buying more pens, but I, you know, in whatever the the purest definition of capitalism, I should try to get as many people to buy as many pens as possible, right? But we we kind of don't necessarily do that necessarily. We're not like pushing everything on everybody and it's like, oh, you should just buy this because it will make you happy and solve all your life's needs. Yeah. I hope I, we don't. I don't feel like we do. We try not to have that vibe, you know. What we try to do is we try to like think about like what is the what is the problem you're trying to solve and will this pen meet that meet that need. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, we have a huge focus on like education, trying to help you in your buying decisions that, you know, what, what you're looking at, we want you to understand what it is, especially being an online company, you can't physically hold the pen in your hand. So we talk about them, we give our opinions about them. We have tech specs, we have pictures, we have all kinds of work that we do to try to accurately really represent like what the product is, but we're never trying to like, m encourage people to buy things that they don't need or shouldn't have or can't afford or any of those types of things. So there is that line because, you know, obviously there could be a, you could argue there's a financial incentive for us to cross that line, but that's where like that sense of like personal responsibility and kind of moral and ethics as a company kind of fits in. And, you know, it's just something we have to think about. Um, what I do like about fountain pens in general is, is it, it, the very nature of fountain pens sort of forces everybody to have an intentionality around any products that they're using. So it, it kind of, in some ways, like supports somewhat of that minimalist. Like if you want, if you want to have one fountain pen or a couple of fountain pens and you know, one or two inks and one notebook or something like that, you can do that. And you can basically live the rest of your life kind of in that mode and never go beyond that. And we can, you can solve that need and we can support that. Um, or if you really are an avid collector and you like acquiring, there's plenty of that too. Um, so I think I definitely fall more into the acquiring and kind of collecting camp and it's exciting and we deal with new products. So new stuff comes out and we talk about it. So, you know, we naturally kind of lean more in that direction. Um, but you know, it's, it's something that really kind of boils down, I think, to every person's, um, every person's kind of individual purpose and every, every person's individual preference. Um, but that's why we try not to put things like behind a paywall. That's why we try to just make things accessible to everybody. It's like, give you as much information as you can, let it fit into whatever needs that you have. And then you just kind of make the choice from there. So yeah, I don't know. That's kind of my, my thoughts on the matter. Yeah. Do you feel but, like, do you feel like this culture has in any way affected our business? recently like i haven't uh, noticed i um, say because i mean ever since ever since covid things have been weird and unpredictable anyway so it's not yeah. like we could point a finger at minimalist culture and be like ah that's that that's affecting us so yeah i don't know i don't know how big i mean right minimalism now minimalism is as like a you know as a as a mainstream like i don't i wouldn't call minimalism a mainstream no i think that the movement i think that the economy you know, might you know, in its infinite ebb and ebbs and flows, like yeah. have give us periods of time where being a little bit more conscious about our purchasing habits is a necessity for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might drive some things, you know, the necessity of that kind of influencing an uptick in that culture. Like Justice yeah. said, you know, she did say it again in, you know, parentheses, you know, because it does, we go through waves. In sure. this. So it might, you know, be a result of the economy as well, kind of, uh, that's interesting. Practicing so, uh, different buying behaviors. Yeah, as I reflect on it, I mean, you could uh, you could make an argument for people that are into fountain pens are already a little more kind of intentional and a little more discerning about the type of product that they may use in their life. That's a good point. And they're they're probably discerning about other things that they use in their life too. So it may be that a increase in minimalism across 
the entire population might actually bring more people to the attention of like an intentional product like a fountain pen. Yeah. You know, so in an argument can be made that maybe a rise in minimalism would actually help a niche, you know, product like ours Didn't with fountain about pens. That. Or you could you could argue that like if people as a whole are being more minimalist and just cutting back on the things they're buying in general, would they then cut back on buying fountain pens? I could see it's probably a blend of both. Yeah. So I I don't know. I don't really have good data to go on to say one way or the other. You know, we're not. I mean, I guess we could like do a survey of our customers or something and see if that's if they would consider themselves to be minimalists or whatever. But I don't know. It, would, it wouldn't a lot be of the factors. It, yeah, it wouldn't be the you know. We've definitely heard from customers who have found their way to fountain pens through a an attempt at kind of. Um, managing their sustainability um yeah so oh, yeah. it's it's definitely within that target for sure for a lot of people um but as far as right now has an uptick been noticed by us in terms of purchasing behaviors i, I don't think so i haven't seen anything that would lead no me to idea. believe that i have no idea my gut my gut tells me and i don't know i don't know how much of this has truly changed since we've been in business versus like since before we were around and then after. So obviously I would only have perspective on kind of since we started selling fountain pens. But my guess is that there's been somewhat of a rise of minimalism as there's also been a rise in things like social media and sharing of education for free and things like that. People connecting to each other in communities like I, I it's not like it's not like you know, fountain pens are deeply tied into that necessarily, but I think like you see a rise in all kinds of niche products because of accessibility and online, you know, commerce sites that can specialize in any obscure thing that people might be interested in, that yeah. people can connect to each other in any obscure interest they might have. There's probably a rise of very particular hobbies since the internet has come about and social media has connected everybody and stuff like that. Fountain pens, I'm sure, have benefited in many ways because of that. Minimalism probably has gotten more awareness and more of a movement around it since more of that has been shared. It's kind of like yeah. other trending things like off-grid living and, you know, uh, whatever, whatever you know, things seems to be trending. You know, the more information that can be shared about it. I don't know if it's like had the time yet since there's been a rise of like education and people connecting around these things. I don't know if there's been like enough history yet to see that there's like an ebb and a flow around that or if it's just been like more kind of growing over time. That makes sense. I don't know. It's a very interesting question. I'll have to kind of reflect on that a little bit. But either way, I think, you know, I think we're just going to continue to do what we do. And the beautiful thing about, you know, all of this is that we make available what we have and people will buy it if it meets their need. And if not, well, then that's fine too. But by focusing a lot on education and promoting and talking about the stuff that we have, it just allows people to have more informed decisions to either buy or not buy. So that's what we focus on. There we go. Cool. Nice. Great that was question. a fun one. Great question. Yeah. Um, if you have additional questions, please um, look out on the YouTube community because we're posting on there. You can leave comments on any given Pencast video and we'll scoop those up. And uh, yeah, we're posting on Instagram every now and then asking for them. Drew will gather them up and we'll pontificate. Uh, or you can email us at pencast at gulaypens.com, especially if you're an audio listener and you are not leaving comments on YouTube in places. So um, <clears throat> we're going to skip. We're, we're going to keep a little lighter pencast this week. We're going to skip spotlight. We're going to skip a pen guessing segment or whatever we might put here. And we're just going to go right into what's happening. All right, Drew. Well, Brian, we had a longish weekend. We did have a longish weekend. And I need to just publicly um, thank you and both allow you the opportunity to apologize to me. <laughs> um, because okay, uh, Friday was my 12th anniversary with the company. It was. And yeah. you decided to show kindness and hatred. I wouldn't say hatred. That's a strong me. word. Um it was the, like this, a, this fine, fine gentleman decided that I needed a Waffle House gift card because he loves me. But then this terrible, terrible human being decided that I needed a very large box of dots because he hates me. 
It's not because I hate you. It was like uh, more just, of like a let's a, unpack this. like a teasing, like you would get from like a sibling or a close. This, is, this was it was an emotional roller coaster for me. I was I was. <laughs> well, I started. I gave you some nerds. Those little nerds. Yeah, like clumps. Nerd clumps. Nerd yeah. clumps are great. So and then, I was I was I was elated. I was joyous. Yeah. Cloud nine. So I brought your spirits up, and, yep. then, I, and then I quickly knocked them down with the dots. Devastation. And then sadness, I brought you right back up. Sorrow. But it was a net positive with the wa <laughs> Waffle House card. That's what I was going for. I wanted to take you on a journey. It's just like it's just like any good movie, Drew. It's got your setup, and then it's got your conflict in the there middle. There was a conflict, and yes. And then you've got your resolution in the yes. end. So I was trying to take you on a journey. Oh, uh, yeah. It was rough. <laughs> it was rough. But yeah, that was uh, that was Friday. That, <laughs> that was how I began the weekend. Um, and then uh, Saturday, we actually um, spent the day in Williamsburg. We met oh. up with our friends Michael and Brittany and their kids. Um, okay. And uh, it's not every day. It's very often because most of our friends don't have kids uh, that Archer gets to hang out with other kids. So that's always hmm. pleasant. Uh, before we met with them for lunch, uh, we went to the outlets in Williamsburg. Oh, yeah. And I went to my favorite place in the world, the Converse outlet. And <laughs> I didn't... I did lose a pair of chucks, so I had to toss one because the oh. soles started opening up like a Roger Rabbit shoe. Um, <laughs> so those had to go out. It happened at the Chicago Pen Show. They started falling apart, and every oh. time I moved, they were like, click, click, flop, flop. Oh, yeah. I tried gluing them together, bought some stuff called shoe goo. Yeah, I've heard um, of this. And uh, it glued some of it together, but then mm. it opened up on another part. Oh. So I'm like, they, you're, you're, and like yeah. you, you could poke the sole and like, it was like really thin. So they were, they were it was time it to just, go. So it was time. Went to the Converse outlet. I got two pair of Converse's oh. for 50 bucks. Wow. $25 a pair. That's pretty good. Right? That's pretty good. Look at these. Look, they got. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Nice and green. Y'all can see that. They're yeah. lovely. Looking And I got, looking I got these and I got some, some orangey red ones. Okay. So I'm just, and we got, some, we got a pair for Archer too for 15 bucks. Hey. Fifteen dollars shoe. I mean, it's just a cloth flap over yeah, a but piece of rubber. Kid destroys shoes like every Tuesday, so I'm I'm, yeah, I'm buying loving, shoes for kids is like I'm loving a fifteen dollars yeah, shoe. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. So we did that. Um, <laughs> uh, good outlet time. Went to food for thought. Got my Ooh, shrimp yeah. and grits because oh. that is just the best thing in That's the world. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, overall a nice, nice little, nice little pleasant, pleasant trip there. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, Sunday, Shannon went to see the Little Mermaid movie. She had a friend who invited a bunch of people over for this friend's birthday, and she like rented out a movie theater um, over here at Bowtie. Oh, wow, you can do that apparently. Oh, I didn't I know, know that. You could do that, and they don't show previews either when you do that. So, you know, um, okay. so she got to see the Little Mermaid movie. Um, she wore her Little Mermaid dress and all of her Little Mermaid jewelry, which you know she has plenty of. Um, and then after they saw that, we met them at our friend's house for a kind of like a dual birthday party dinner sort of thing. Hmm. So, um, rainy, not particularly pleasant yeah. this weekend. So yeah, weather was, yeah, yeah, you know, but it was, it was nice. And, uh, you know, that was Saturday night and then, nice. um, Sunday, what did we do on Sunday? I wrote it down. Oh, no, that was Sunday. That was Sunday. Then Monday. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. We had an extra day. Mm -hmm. So Monday was another uh, event. We went over our friends Rick and David's house, and um, they have a pool. Nobody was in it because the weather was crappy. Mm -hmm. Archer definitely got in it though because he didn't care. He was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna swim." So it was just a bunch of adults, and then Archer just flopping around in the pool. Um, didn't remember how to swim at first. Got a little upset about that, and I was like, "Dude, just keep on trying. You're gonna be okay." And yeah, I'll figure it out. He got it, and yeah. he was he was having a blast. Um, and then uh, uh, Rick. Um, uh, you know, we were at his house. Mm. He was just walking me through all of this, his outdoor garden stuff. And he knows so much about mm. plants. And I just was hanging on every word huh. because I, I, I'm interested in that, but I don't know a ton. Yeah. But uh, I will say that I am absolutely going to buy a Japanese maple now because those are some oh. of the most beautiful trees I've ever seen. Hmm. And you can get a you can keep them kind of little too for a while. Yeah. They grow very slowly. So yeah, I'm going to find a Japanese maple like this weekend. It oh. needs to happen. I'm okay. obsessed with that now. Yeah. All right. So that was pleasant. Um, it did end up starting to rain, but that was after we went into the house for dinner. So Archer got his time. Um, and uh, yeah, and nature told us when he needed to stop. So there you go. That was just fine. I have a savings app. 
that I use mm-hmm. that all of my dumb purchases that I sure. want to buy, you know, I, I have a little thing. It'll, I set a date Your and I say, purchases. I want, I want, you know, 300 some dollars by, you know, January 24th or whatever. Yeah. And then it'll just take a little bit, take a little bit, take a little bit mm-hmm. and then I'll have it. So yeah, I want to buy something dumb. I don't have to yeah. feel like I'm pulling it right out of a, a pay check that. Yeah. So I had been doing that for a TV because I want a PS5, but I don't have a 4K TV. So oh, yeah. um, okay. there's really no point in hmm. doing that. Um, hmm. So I needed to buy a TV and I had been saving up and it was almost there. Hmm. But just last week, whatever, something happened where my bank was no longer talking to this app. Oh. So the only thing I could do was to completely disconnect my bank from the app, hmm. reinstall all the stuff. So mm-hmm. I had to, so all my money in this app went right back to my bank. So I was like, you know what? What the heck? I was really close to the TV. Let me just go ahead and pick up a TV. Mm-hmm. So I got a TV. Got a 4K, okay. 4K TV this weekend. Right, that's uh, exciting. I broke up with Samsung and went the more affordable route. Bought myself a Vizio. Okay. Um, I've been a diehard Samsung purist for as long as I can remember. Uh-huh. But it doesn't matter. And it's probably made in the same factory I, anyway. Th- that's what I was saying. You know, and <laughs> I told my brother I got a Vizio. He's like, oh, that's cool. They're like Kia. They used to be crappy, but now they're good. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so got myself a Vizio. It's working. It's big, but I don't have anything that can make a 4K <laughs> signal. So it's just kind of, you know. It's got untapped potential. Yes. That's all. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, that's one step closer to my PS5 adventures. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. We went to Target. It was kind of a late night thing. Shane's like, so like, do you just want to go ahead and get it? Like you, you were basically there. I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So we just left. We went to get it. It was kind of late. Like for Archer, it was probably like, you know, 8.30. So he should have gone to bed. Yeah. But we just thought we'd go be in and out. We checked the inventory. They had them at the Target. We're going to yeah. grab it. Uh, got there. You know, they're still walking around. I walked with the guy to load it up into the CRV. Yeah. And uh, fold the seats down. It takes up all the room. So I had to go back in to tell Shannon. I'm like, hey, uh, I've got no room for the kid <laughs> anymore. So... <laughs> Whoops. Can, can y'all just stay here at Target while I go home and <laughs> drop this off? So that is exactly mm. what happened. I and he's like tied to the roof like Clark it, Griswold or something. Pretty much. And oh it was raining. So <laughs> Oh yeah. gosh. So that wasn't an option. Um so I was I was scooched all the way forward. So mm. I'm like driving driving like this down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh finally, you know, got it got it offloaded into the house, came back, picked them up, and that was the end of that night. But uh that was that was interesting. Darn, she had to spend a little more time at Target. What is she that, 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 see, that, that's exactly what she said. I got there. I'm like, I'm so sorry. She's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I got to spend extra time at Target? I right. am, I am fine. <laughs> yep. um, so it was an overall a really solid weekend, except for the fact that my wife has decided to become the evil mother from A Christmas Story and try to stifle my joy hmm. and excitement. So... I was on eBay the other day, and I found that uh, a gorgeous stained glass Pizza Hut lamp is only like 350 bucks. <laughs> you know, the ones they used to have hanging over the booths in the Pizza Hut restaurants in the 90s? Yeah. Stunningly beautiful, Brian. They Just, look like something you'd hang over like a pool table, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's stained glass, thing. red and white checkers with a beautiful Pizza Hut written <laughs> on the side. And I'm like, honey, this would look great in our uh, oh, I can see in our eating, why she's not in, as in our eating about kitchen. This as you are. Hang okay. on, hang on. Oh, you want to hang this as a she, fixture in your home? Yeah. Okay. So she hates what's there. It's this, you know, okay. some sort of nickel plated nonsense. Uh-huh. And uh, uh-huh. she wants it gone. I'm like, hey, here we go. We got to compromise. You get that gone, and I get a beautiful, gorgeous, vintage, his like you know, w- w- imbued with history, mm. Americana, mm. Pizza Hut lamp. Okay. And uh, she's not having it, Brian. Not not having not it. Not having it. Not 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 permitting. This is very this. Christmas story-esque. Right? Here. Yeah. This is a major prize, a major award. <laughs> I want it. No. This is so, for Gile. It must be yeah, Italian. Yeah, so um, she's she's <laughs> just, just uh, doesn't want me to be happy at all. Mm. And she, in her righteous ind- indignation, decides to post something about this on her Facebook, thinking that she's going to get a lot of people on her side. Guess what? <laughs> was everybody on Everybody your side? was like, oh, let him get his lamp. Oh. And she was like, oh, she was like, well, I thought oh. you people were my friends. How dare you? <laughs> so uh, wow. we, we were at Rick and David's and there, you know, uh, this came up again because 
uh, I think, I don't remember who it was. It might have been Ricky. Like, hey, I think you should get it, Drew. I, t- I told her that you should. Like, I was like, thank you. And she's just like, you shut oh up. Oh, my like, gosh. She's going to. I'm telling you, the people are on my side, Brian. I don't know. I know. I'm not going to get it. I don't think it. it's going to help your I, situation. It's, it's not. It's not. I know. <laughs> I don't know how you win. It does not situation. It would not go at all either. No. It's like, not at all. But then, like not, the, but then I was like, all right, well, it's like we the St. Pauli girl in what we, the yes, office. Exactly. It's going to be kind of like that. Exactly. Well, what we can do is we can just get some nice puffy booths to put there instead of the. <laughs> My <clears> gosh. And just go all in. Get the nice gingham tablecloth. Get those plastic red cups. And just... have you ever have you ever seen? There's an Instagram channel called uh, uh, what is it? Hang on, I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, it's oh, shoot. It's something. It's got something with Zillow in it. Zillow, Zillow, gone, Zillow wild. gone wild. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll follow them. You're describing your house slowly turning into a Zillow gone wild, and then slowly turning into a pizza like, hut. Just like this looks like a pretty normal house in a pretty you know normal neighborhood, and then you look in there and you're like, there's an entire Pizza Hut booth in this kitchen. Like, I love what that kind idea. of person would do this? We don't have a lot of people coming over. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If anything, it would if if she wants to have guests over, why wouldn't they come to see the Pizza Hut lamp? <laughs> it's an attraction. They're like, oh wow! I get my lamp. Yeah, there's something she, said she for gets. Them. She gets, uh, you know, more visitation opportunities. Mm. Maybe I don't know. Mm. I, f- I feel like this is a definite win. So well, it's not me. You got to convince about this. <clears throat> there's only one person you got to convince I in know. this situation. I know. Good luck. What to if you. it just shows up and like I'm like, oops, it was eBay. <laughs> I can't really return it. The something guy was a jerk. Me, something tells me that wouldn't help at all <laughs> in the situation. <laughs> Oh man! What if you just installed it? If you if it was already there and installed? Yeah, why not? Would What's she, the worst would that could she happen? Make you take it down. She would probably just be like, "This is beautiful. This is the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen in my life." Well, maybe that's just a risk you'll have to take. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that's probably the way to go. <laughs> Nothing bad could happen. <laughs> there. What's the worst that could happen in this situation? <laughs> Drew will be yeah. sleeping at the office here. So yeah, I'm fine. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that that's that's my current life challenge. You know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if that's the biggest problem you're dealing with, yeah, it's a pretty good life. I don't know. It's, know. it's quite devastating, Brian. Well, you, you know, know, we all Insurmountable, have our cross to bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I don't need to disappoint you and end on a downer because I know that you're mm. very, very concerned with my I am the very important things in my well, life. Well, I care about you as a whole person, yes. Drew, not just at work, but in your home. There we go. Yeah, so I just, I wanted too. to be vulnerable and let you know. Like, okay, so should I message yeah. Stan and be like, I really think Drew should get that line. No, I mean, we'll probably have <laughs> to, help. we'll probably have to go to therapy about it. You know, it's oh going to be gosh. rough. We're going to have to rumble some. Um, <laughs> hopefully we won't uh, resign this to irreconcilable differences. Uh, oh, I, wow. I hate for this to come between us, but. Uh, well. Yeah, this might be it. Yeah, wow. Like, yeah. Okay. The line, well, the line has been drawn. Do keep me in the loop on that <laughs> one. Wow. Seriously, though, I do kind of want it. Anyway. I mean, I, I, get, the appe- I get the appeal. There's definitely appeal. But that that's a pretty central – that's a pretty central <laughs> – yeah, And we don't even have a separate like, dining room. Thing. It's just – Oh, wow. So the, it would be the back like, of our, the, the, our house is like kitchen – no, it's not – Kitchen, kind of eat-in area, mm-hmm. living room. Like it's all one It's all thing. connected. And it's so like, the Pizza Hut lamp will be right in the middle. It would of... be like the heart yes. of the house. <laughs> yes. That's a tough sell, man. That's yeah, tough I sell. Think the house it's one thing if it's like sort of a little, you know, whatever, call it a man cave or something. No. It's like off in the, and you no. can sort of like shove it away uh-uh. and she can ignore it and whatever. No, but front no, and center. This, oh, that's going to be a tough one. <laughs> That might be a tough sell. I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm expecting good progress. Yeah. Well, I expect, you know, we're, there's a will, there's a way, mm. Drew. We'll see how that goes. Oh, my. Okay. I'm just trying to think, like, we don't have anything like that in our house that's, like, so, <laughs> I sem- don't think so most central. Do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have any. I don't have any design aesthetic that I feel strongly enough about to to really push Rachel in any one direction. And she's you know, I have my I have her. I have my den. I got that decorated the way I want to. It's yeah. very nerdy, but uh, yeah, we got. I think the pizza lamp would really bring everything together as a unifying <laughs> element. <laughs> well, we've got our situation in our kitchen where we have a fixture that we don't that neither of us really likes oh don't you have a fluorescent up there yeah it's it's i think yeah, i've heard you it's like f- yeah a, like a four foot fluorescent tube i think i've heard you fixture. hate on this thing before but it's like built into the ceiling like it's probably a, it uh, like drops down from the ceiling and it's like drywalled frame like it's like it's probably load bearing it's like a structure it's, <laughs> it's load bearing the light it's just it's the light hanging but it's this it's this huge thing it's like a four foot 
you know, four tube fluorescent fixture. Oh boy. But the, the, the fixture itself, like the ballast crapped out on the thing. So I didn't want to go buy a new whole fixture. So I just bought like an LED one, but it doesn't quite fit in there. So it's like, I kind of shoved it in there <laughs> diagonally. So I've got, and it's got like the, the kind of frosty, oh my you God. know, plastic yeah. diffuser on it too. So it's it's like an office fixture light. That's amazing. With like a, a, an LED now tube that's diagonal across it. And that I'm like, this thing beautiful. is beautiful. And it's just in the kitchen. It's been, you know, we've been in our house, what, 11 years or something it's like that? It's a great spot for Pizza Hut light it's right just, there. You know, we could definitely use something in there. But Rachel was like, maybe we could do recessed lights or something. I'm like that, like retrofitting recessed lights. I don't even know how to actually do that. Like, I got those done in my house. Um, yeah. So, well, they they don't have to be recessed cans. They have these okay. really low profile ones that okay. don't require like drilling and installation. Okay. They're like little LED discs that only, oh. that can go right up into the drywall almost. Huh. Okay. Um, so they don't requ require can install the canless. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can get them done for- um, Even like running the wire? Like how do you even do uh, that? Do you have to like drill through the, cause it's like, you, you do, have a second floor. So it's yeah, like, you do, there's no you, attic or anything. No, 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 you need to, you need to- um, Like drill up through the beams that are running I, like- I wasn't there when they did it. But that's the only way I can think. But yeah, I think I think you have to. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't sound exciting to me. So <laughs> get, get somebody to do it for you then. Uh, yeah, I don't like to pay people to do things at my house either. I mean, so when it when that. it crosses into a <sighs> that that is what that is. right. Yeah, see, if you, Rachel was like firm about doing that, but she like throws it out there, and I'm like, what? Okay, would you like? It made it. You want? She's it like, lights really everything know. really yeah. evenly. It yeah. looks good. I know. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. We'll see. You still have to patch a huge. Square, well, that's though. the whole thing is like, yeah. okay, I could get an electrician, but an electrician is not going to take out that existing situation. So now I'm into, I'm into like, I'm becoming a general contractor now yeah. to deal with this old light fixture. So I don't know. We've just not dealt with it. <laughs> it's yeah. just sitting there. See, all we had was just like a, a single, well, one room had no lights. So that was easy. And one room had a mm. single light and then they just put a plate over that. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We all have our things, right? I don't yes. Know this but anyway, so we've got the opposite situation. We have an ugly fixture that neither of us, neither of us likes, yeah. but neither of us wants to deal with it either. So it just stays there. Anyway, there's light in the kitchen. That's all that matters. <laughs> Diagonal um, light. Yeah. So I had an eventful weekend as well myself. Really an eventful Thursday through today, Tuesday. That's through. right. You had company. Yeah. Rachel's sister and her family came down. So their kids are out of school. So they were like, we, it's summer. And our kids are like, we've got three more weeks left. Yep. So <laughs> yeah, yep. there was that. Um, but I mean, it was a great time to get to see them. And, you know, my niece and nephew were younger than my kids. So it's like, you know, getting to like relive the, the younger kid stuff just the wonder and doing dance routines to demo songs on the like electric piano thing and you know just nice that that kind of goofy stuff and having having fun and stuff like that um so that was cool there were eight of us in the house four of them children for five days so it was exciting so not quite outnumbered times. but it probably sounded like it yeah we were they were we were definitely outnumbered in energy mm -hmm. like in yeah in spirit yeah. um <laughs> Um, but we took out the RC car. We played board games. We did all the fun things. So that was that was a blast. That sounds really exhausting, though. It was it was it was fine. <laughs> Good memories were made, but uh, no, it was great. I mean, they're 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 just young kids. That's all, and they just having a blast. Um, played some board games. They love telestrations, so we did plenty of that. They love what? That was very interesting. Telestrations. Oh, that's the it's name of board kind game. of like yeah, it's kind of like Pictionary sort of. Okay. But everybody's got like a dry erase board. And you take turns like guessing what was drawn previously. And then if you have the word, then you have to draw it out. So everybody's like, as you pass it around, everybody's like switching like the drawing and the guessing. Huh. So it's kind of like Pictionary combined with the game like Telephone where you've got to kind oh, of do it through. Okay. So basically as the things make their way all around the table, some things get like hilariously misinterpreted. Oh, I see. So it's not really about like keeping a score or whatever. Nice. It's more just about like laughing. Oh, that's great. Those are the what best somebody games. thought somebody else drew and how, you know. I love to see. I usually, ice, cream, ice cream truck turned into like astronaut dinosaur or something. That's awesome. I hilarious. usually have no patience for games, board games or anything like that. But that like those just like let's sit yeah. in a group and make dumb jokes and laugh at each other like that. that I love that. That's not true. That, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. cool. I can yeah, that's that. kind of what this is. But that was pretty fun. Um, we did... Uh, uh, I did, we did a waffle party. So like we did breakfast for dinner, but we like 
went all out with the oh, waffles and stuff like that. Speaking so, of changuage. That was fun. That was fun with bacon and all, all the good stuff. So mm. that was last night. That Any was, savory that situation really or all sweet? Uh, pretty much all sweet. I mean, okay. we had the bacon with savory, but okay. we pretty much went all sweet on the uh, waffle front. It was mm. pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, I went through like a box and a half of like batter mix you know, to get the waffles to everybody. It was pretty mm. good. Um, with that, I uh, had some, so last time that, that they came down, I had some workshop time with my niece and I made, uh, you know, a little guitar and yeah. a couple other things. Yeah, yeah. So apparently she has been so excited to come back. It was like one of her favorite things was Yay! to do some workshop You've time. You've got a little Padawan. I've got to like, do a little Padawan. Um, so she was really excited. She even like had a journal at school and she wrote in her journal about what she was going to build next Aww. time she came down. And I was like, that's cool. It's like, you know, this is our special little thing. That is amazing. So she came down and she had a vision in mind for what she wanted to build. Okay. And I was like, okay. Another last musical instrument? Last time, well, last time she wanted to build a go-kart. Oh, God. A working go-kart. Oh She's God. seven. So, you know, I was like, that's ambitious. Let's think of something more practical. Mm -hmm. So this time, you know, we had several days and I was like, okay, we could take on a slightly bigger project. So uh, the thing that she wanted to build was a pair of crutches. Oh. Like when you sprain your ankle, like crutches. And I was like, is she injured? No, she's not injured. She just has really wanted her own pair of crutches. And her, bless her heart. Like her parents were like, I don't know if Uncle Brian will be able to do that, but we'll ask him, you know. And so she was really excited about it. So I was like, I, I was like, okay. <laughs> And I was trying to think like, cause you know, I'm thinking like medical crutches, you know, they have to be like very adjustable and all yeah, this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I was like, this is a seven year old and you need to do one we of those don't have to tiny, make tiny Tim style we don't have crutches. To make, yeah. We don't yeah. have to make medical grade crutches nah. here. So instead of going like with all the adjustable, everything, I was like, we're just going to make this just fixed. Yeah. Well, I'll like measure her and stuff like that and want it to be like mildly comfortable, but it's like, she might both physically and metaphorically outgrow these. So we'll just... <laughs> I'm not going to make these to like last her into a dog. Yeah. I think we can go with something relatively simple and it'll just continue to be a thing. So uh, we made a pair of crutches and, uh, you know, I went with like a, a fairly, you know, fairly informal V shape of the crutch. Okay. And uh, I like somewhat planned it out, but I had to improvise a little bit. And, uh, you know, it ended up turning out to be, you know, a working oh, look at that. pair of crutches, you know, you made that, to you, fit her. How'd you get that wood bent? I didn't bend it. We like started with a bigger piece of wood and cut it out oh, and shaped it and all that kind oh, of stuff. I got so you. yeah, and it's like glued and kind of screwed together. Oh. So it's like you know, it's not really adjustable at this point. But I mean, it does the job. It is there a functional go. pair of crutches well, that I built hope with She my never niece. needs them. Well, she was just she was like on cloud nine. She was so excited. Hopefully, she doesn't get injured while she's on them. I hope she never has to actually <laughs> use them right. for like medical use. But um, yeah, she. Uh, wanted it to, she was so excited. She wanted it to be a secret of what we were working on. So it took us like two days to do it. Not like two full days, but like we did it over two days. She didn't want anybody to go into the workshop. She didn't want me to tell anybody what we were working on. And then once we were done, she just like came in and was like on these crutches. And like everybody was so excited because she was so excited right. to be able to do them. Oh. And nobody else in the family was like really expecting me to be able to actually help her build some crutches. But yeah, she did a great job. And she found like my label maker that I used to like label my screw hardware bins and stuff like that. And she made like a thousand labels out of there too. And I was like, all right, that's cool. Yeah. And like previously when I did it, I was like trying to help her like do every step of the process. And on this one, I was like, yeah, this is kind of just too much for that. So I was like, we're gonna use more power tools and I'm just gonna have her like sort of help me or watch. And there we go. we're gonna like kind of more crank she this She can do some out. sanding. Yeah, sanding. She did help me, anything that needed to be like kind of a straight cut. Mm -hmm. Like we use the handsaw and oh, you know, that kind of a stuff. Nice. So like, you know, I did it with her, you know, that kind of a thing. But I was like, no, for like, you know, using the bandsaw, like cutting out like yeah, the shape and all that. I was like, there's no way I'm going to try to teach her to do any of this. Yeah. So we're just going to, I'll just did you ever have, have her one observe of those, and talk through what I'm doing. Did you ever want to have one of those label makers when you were little that like you squeeze and it like, like, oh yeah, oh, you man. like, you like punch it out yeah. and you like tur I had, turn the letter at the top. My like, mom gave me one that was from, you know, probably the sixties uh, because <laughs> it was lime green and it had a flower on it. 
<laughs> nice. And I loved that thing. I would make labels for everything. I mean, every kid loves label makers. Yeah, they do. Yeah. That's legit. Yeah. I love that thing. She was living her best life. She used nice. up my entire role of labels. That's super cool of you to let her just kind of. Yeah. I, I feel like I would be a stick in the mud about that. Like, I, I, I would. Th I thought about that, but at the end of the day, I was like, you know, I can buy more labels. That's really cool. But like, giving I, her a cool experience. I'm going to endeavor like, to be yeah. more like that because I definitely mm -hmm. have my moments where. I'm like, no, you're gonna use it up all, use up all of it. But I need to make sure that I'm not See, doing that too much. If it was my own kids, I'd be more inclined to do that. Yeah. But I don't know, some because it was her. Yeah. Like I'm the the cool uncle. Yeah. It's a little more like, yeah, okay. I whatever. know, but I, I, as much. I need to do that more with my son. Like, mm. you know, really remembering like this doesn't actually matter. Like, yeah. If he's forming a happy yeah. memory and he's like, not what does it cost me? Like five bucks for exactly. a label thing? Exactly. Like, okay. I need to. I. It's just like sometimes you get used to. You know, mm -hmm. telling them like, no, stop it. No, stop it. Like you just kind of get into that habit and yeah. you need to remind yourself yeah. like, ah, oh, hold on. This actually doesn't matter mm -hmm. at all. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, we all it's, do it. It's yeah, actual. it is. I'm trying to be it's better natural. about that. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. Nice. Um, so the crutches thing. And then, you know, it was this is actually mostly before they came and visited. I finished my chessboard. Oh, so good. Literally finished it. So. Got it all sanded nice, got nice. a real nice finish on it. I beveled the edges mm. and uh, yeah, so now I have a functional chessboard. Not that it wasn't f really functional before, but nice. Look yeah, at that. it's got a nice finish on it. Maple and walnut. Mm. And then, you know, I didn't make any pieces for it. So I'm just using the That's plastic pieces I already though. have. So it's like a white and blue, which doesn't really match the chessboard, but still whatever. I got that a nice works. looking chessboard. So that's beautiful. Yeah, if I want to well be done. fancier and not have a little roll out rubber chessboard thing. You do want to no, be fancy. No, no, I can be fancy with there my wooden go. chessboard. You need to be. Yep. And then um, another exciting thing is we got to watch the Mario movie finally. That's right, that's right. We did not do it in the theater because we just couldn't figure out. Is it available in the theater? Out. So you can rent or buy it oh, digitally. Really? Yes. Wow, that's quick. Which I had mixed feelings about. So I guess it's going to be on streaming at some point, maybe December or something like that. But we basically bought it digitally for if, way more money than I wanted to pay for it. you know it's going to be watched again and again and again, though. Well, it came down to, like, Ellie has really wanted to see it. Yeah. All of her friends are, like, talking about yeah. it and, like, trying not to spoil it. But she it's like she's having to almost daily endure yeah. and not having it spoiled for her. And we knew that we wanted to see it well, anyway. Well, think about so it also, like, like, taking all those kids to the movie theater would have been, like, $100. Oh, so, yeah, like, it was definitely what less expensive. Well, yeah. see... My niece and nephew didn't want to see it. It was like too much for them. They're like, just didn't, didn't find it appealing. Oh. They love Mario, but just a little too intense for them just by their own preference. They saw the trailer and it was not, so they didn't actually want to see it. So that was what complicated the whole thing. Oh, so wow. we talked about like renting or whatever. And it was just like, how are we going to do this? You know, cause it's like, yeah, they go to bed early, but my kids, you're, you know, they're not like full grown adults, you know, to watch. To send the little kids to bed and then watch an entire movie after that, it's like they're staying up pretty late. So, you know, between that and like <laughs> Rachel and her sister and everybody else, like them also not staying up so late because, you know, that's a thing now. Um, but finally, it worked out last night, even though it was technically a school night for my kids. We let them stay up a little bit and we like gave the niece and nephew, some melatonin gummies a little on the early side, <laughs> started the bed routine a little bit earlier. But they like stayed in bed. They didn't do it. You That's know, amazing. Didn't do anything. So it's like we we were just like, all right, <laughs> like mid afternoon. We were like, here's a plan. We're gonna do the. We're gonna have dinner. We're gonna do the illustrations. Then we're gonna do a little bit of Mario Kart and all that. And then we'll get the littles to bed. And then you know, if everything works out, we'll try to watch the Mario movie tonight. And I was like, what are the chances of this actually working? And I was like, all right, we'll go for it. And we made it happen. Nice. And we watched it. Well, good. I'm glad for yeah. Ellie. Yep. And then we snuck in one episode of Severance as well, my brother-in-law and I, because he's, we watched the first two episodes last time he was down, like six weeks ago, and then we were able to get one more episode in on this trip. Nice. So we'll just watch the whole thing every time he comes down. Nice. So now I got to decide, am I going to watch the rest of the season? All you the are. Through now? You I don't are. know if I will, because this was like, we just jumped in, it was like episode three. You're, you, and that's something's going to so happen. You'll be like, oh, well, I could do something or I could watch Severance. Well, you know what? It, you know what, though, is there's a writer strike going on right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so all that's on hold. So mm -hmm. they're like in mid-production, but they're like, we're definitely making season two, but it's like indefinite as to when they're going to pick up production yeah. again. I was like, ah. I don't have to worry about that so much because I just, 
uh, we just finished the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, okay. which uh, well, that ended up being a phenomenal season finale. They, about they that, did a yeah. great job wrapping that up, a shockingly good job wrapping that up. Hmm. And cool. then we just started the last season of Ted Lasso, which is going to be their final season. So right. with those two having that series ending with Maisel yeah. and knowing that this is the final season of Ted Lasso, I, I won't like. I know that I'm not getting more of either yeah. of those, so the strike isn't going to negatively impact that. Um, yeah. I did hear, interestingly enough, that uh, they're filming the third Deadpool movie with Ryan Reynolds. Mm -hmm. And because he is a WG WGA member and a writer on the film currently filming, he can't legally improv anything while filming. Hmm. Huh. Because I guess that's considered contributing to dialogue. Um, and as a writer, he can't do that um, without breaching the union's, uh, hmm. uh, you know, whatever, president. So hmm. imagine being a musician and writing your own song and then going in to actually record it in the studio, but not being able to change you anything. You can't change anything. Yeah. Like, no, nope, just record it. Like, yeah, I know, but I, this part was bugging me earlier. And now I, now that I'm hearing it, I'm realizing, nope. You can't do it. Can't do it. I'm like, oh my God, how could you? That's the rules. I know. That's crazy. Yeah. Crazy times. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, I'm not educated enough on the whole writer strike to be able to comment any further than that. But I know, I know, it, AI is a it's a big thing, big part of it. It's yeah, a big thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um. Yeah. And then basically all the rest of my time has been uh, working on onboarding a new hire that we have here, which is going to start to bleed over into company updates here. But that is definitely taking a lot of my extra time, uh, training and just prepping and doing all that kind of stuff. So. I guess we'll ease into company updates now. Company um, updates. Yeah, first one is we want to welcome Jenea to our team. She technically started with us last week, but we didn't have her picture or anything up on the website and all that. But um, she is new to the team. She's our marketing specialist. So she is going to be contributing to what a lot of you all are going to start to see. So largely, she's helping to like coordinate a lot of stuff. Um, she's got a marketing background, but she's new to Fountain Pens much like we all were at one point in time. So she's getting the deep dive on everything, getting her up to speed all over the place. Um, but she's learning very quickly. Um, and I could, you know, we'll like more formally introduce her and probably have her pop in, you know, on some stuff here and there. But yeah, you'll start to interact with her a little bit more, maybe on some social channels and stuff like that over time as she learns stuff. But uh, yeah, new member on the team. So we're very excited. I'm glad because like really ever since COVID kind of hit, we've been holding the fort with... <laughs> You know, social media stuff and, you know, haven't been as active on all channels as we normally would like to be, but we're getting there. We're getting there. So it took us a, a good effort to find her, but uh, we found her. So pretty excited. So we'll have her, I, I'm pretty sure, I hope by Friday, by the time this video launches, we'll have her up on the website so we can link to, link to uh, her bio. But anyway, you'll start to see her. So welcome Janae to the team. She's very excited. And then um, we are not doing another non-pencast video this week because as I mentioned last week, we got Fountain Pen 101, which we did get out last week. We are working on episode, episode part two, I guess. So that is in the process right now. We're editing it and all that. We're spacing those out. It's taken more time and effort to get those out, but the first part seemed to go over pretty well. And they're going to get a little more technical too. So I think y'all will actually appreciate them more, even just in the introductory episode. But obviously, most of, of you feedback. didn't need to know what a fountain pen was. But yes, yes. Still a lot of kind comments. But still, yeah, we really appreciate that. And trying to stay, you know, to our roots and stuff like that of bringing new people into fountain pens. Um, so even just having resources for you all, maybe if you're not new to fountain pens, just having good resources that you can share with other people who are new to fountain pens um, to get them into a beautiful world that we all live in. Um, so yeah, we'll have more of that coming out. But if the other videos are a little more sparse right now, that's why. But we should see the rest. It's going to be a five-part series that we've got all planned out. And we're going to actively work on posting that over the next couple of months. And uh, yeah, I think that's mostly all we've got going on, Drew. So we'll wrap this thing up. But we want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions in the comments. Uh, and we'd be happy to answer them on the show. You can definitely check out gulepens.com for ink, paper, and pen needs. Subscribe to all of our channels and you'll get more content. And I have a very just quick fun fact for you today, Drew. Uh, I was thinking about piston filling pens and cartridge converter pens and all that. Yes. And I was thinking like, you know, who is it that came up with the piston pen? Like, where did the first one start? 
Marvin uh, Saint Germain. I don't think that that's true. I don't know who that is. Depends but, on which account you're reading. Um, so it's my understanding. I I didn't research this super super deeply, but I believe that Pelican was actually the first one to patent the piston filling pen. That sounds familiar. 1929. Yeah. In fact, do you remember they did like a 90th anniversary pen for the piston? Uh, yeah, a their few founder years back. Uh, Pelly Can, you know, C A N N E S, like the festival. Right. Yeah. Sure. Pelly Can. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not true at all. Drew is doing his uh, lying thing again that he started out with at the beginning of the show. Maybe you're lying. Um, but yeah, first about first pest, piston filling fountain pen patented for Pelican in, in Croatia, I believe, in 1929. Ah. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I believe I read that somewhere. Recently. Yeah. So thank there you. you go. Thank you, Pelly. Thank you, Pelly. Good design. Anyway, that's all we got for y'all this week. Thanks so much for watching and right on. <laughs>